everyone. My name is Zainab and I'm the events officer for the Melbourne Population and Global Health Student Society. MPGHSS is a non-profit organisation for students of the Melbourne School Population and Global Health, alumni and staff at the University of Melbourne. Developed for students, by students, we aim to provide a platform that enables networks to be formed and strengthened beyond the classroom. I feel honoured to be able to welcome you to our first ever student conference. Who you see now on your screen is the committee members who have been working so hard on this. This is Alex, our treasurer, Miriam, our president, Lou, our vice president, Sophie and Zoe, our social media officers, Coco, our other events officer, Emia and Ross, our course reps, and Femi, our alumni relations officer. Not present in this video are Fabi and Mason, who have also contributed significantly to the creation of this conference, and we thank them a lot for this. We're so happy and proud to be able to bring this to you today and are looking forward to making this an annual thing. We hope you enjoy watching us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first ever Melbourne Population and Global Health Student Society Conference. We are absolutely pleasured to have you with us today. Firstly, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the lands of which we're all gathered today. We are gathered here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you so much for registering and thank you so much for being part of this conference. We're very, very excited. We have a very jam-packed lineup today. And our conference is really centered around the theme of a new era of public health, the influence of technology. The wonderful team that you saw before us were involved in many hours of putting together this conference. And so we really welcome you and encourage you to live tweet and to share this conference and to watch it later on as well and let everyone know about the wonderful work that we have done and that we will continue to do. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on to Luo, who is the vice president of the committee to introduce our first speaker for the day. Thank you and enjoy. Today, Melanie Feinberg. Melanie is currently the Executive Manager of Social Marketing and Communications at Victoria Health. She has many experiences in the government and non-for-profit sectors in Australia and in London. Melanie has worked for more than 20 years across health promotion, road safety, and workplace safety. She is passionate about leading high-performing, engaged teams to produce work that delivers outcomes for people. From big budget TV ads to obesity fighting digital avatars, from press release to promotional postcards, from brand development to, Insta to Instagram story, Melanie has led teams across the world to create work with impact. Now, let's welcome Melanie to begin her talks for today. Thank you. As you can appreciate with live conferences, things do glitch up a bit. So we're just waiting for Melanie to join us. So in the interim, we'll just uh, have a, a quick little moment until Melanie joins us. Thank you.
Welcome, Melanie. Hello. Hi. I can Hello. Hear you. <laughs> Lovely. You're all live now, Melanie. Thanks for joining us today. That's quite all right. This is the beauty of technology, isn't it? Things yeah. can happen. <laughs> That's right. So we've just done a wonderful introduction of yourself. So whenever okay. you're ready, go for it. Okay. So people can see me right now? Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, I can't see anybody else except for Mariam, but hello, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my name is Mel Feinberg. I'm the Executive Manager of Social Marketing at Social Marketing Communications at Vic Health. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm tuning in from beautiful Wurundjeri land in Melbourne, uh, out near the Maribyrnong River, which is normally really gorgeous, but it's a bit of a grey and rainy day today, unfortunately. Hopefully you're having better weather wherever you are. I'll share my screen. Bear with me. Always hoping this works. First go. Great, I can see that. Hopefully everybody else can. Uh, what an exciting topic. What a great opportunity to chat with you all today about a new era of health promotion and the future and, and what that's going to look like and the influence of technology on that. Uh, we've clearly seen a lot of changes over the last little while, so very exciting to talk to you today. Get my slides moving. Here we go. So quick quick rundown of what I was, what I'll plan to cover off. Very quick intro into who is Vic Health. I'm hoping if you're studying health promotion and interested in this, you should already be all over this, but just in case, thought I'd give a quick intro to Vic Health, as well as a quick intro to myself. Who am I to be here talking to you about this topic? What do I know? Uh, in terms of health promotion today and where we're heading, thought it was really interesting to start with a bit of context of where we've come from. So a little bit of reflection looking back where I started in my career 20 years ago in this space and what it looked like then, what's happened in the last two years and what that means for us working in the space right now, what are the opportunities, what are the risks and dangers that we also just need to bear in mind and be aware of. And I know we have some fabulous speakers this afternoon talking about where to next, but I thought I'd put in a very quick two cents worth to uh, start you thinking in that direction. So as I said, starting off with who is Vic Health. So the, we're the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, and we're really focused on improving the health and well-being of everyone, every single person in Victoria. We have a really strong health equity focus, which is why I emphasise the every person. We do that through funding and running world-class programs. We do a lot of research policy development and policy influencing with government. And also we run a lot of campaigns and communications activities, which is where I come into the mix, of course. We were the world's first ever health promotion foundation established back in 1987. It's something we're really proud of. A lot of other similar organisations popped up around the world, internationally, within Australia as well, following our example, which is really fantastic to see. But really great that we're still going strong. In terms of the areas we focus on, it's kind of what you'd expect in a health and wellbeing space, but a broad range of topic areas of promoting healthy eating, encouraging regular physical activity, and improving mental wellbeing, as well as preventing tobacco use and preventing harm from alcohol. I've also just dropped in there, given we are talking about technology and digital and how that influences us, all of the different channels and links where you can stalk Vic Health to your heart's content and follow everything that we're doing. So very quickly, who am I? I've already explained my current role here at Vic Health, a very lucky, fun, fabulous role to head up all of our external marketing and communications and campaign activities across the organisation. But I've spent more than 20 years in social marketing internationally in the government and not-for-profit sectors. I've bumped around Australia a bit, Sydney, Perth and Melbourne, and I've had some experience in London as well. I've worked in health promotion directly, in obesity prevention, providing heart attack support for survivors and their families, 
And I've also worked in areas of workplace safety and road safety. And I've dropped in some of the logos of, you know, some really fantastic organisations and brands that I've been lucky enough to work with over the time. The little image there is one that I hold dear to my heart. Uh, I feel really passionately about using my skills for good um, instead of going over to the dark side. I think when you come up through marketing and uh, promotion and advertising in particular, it's really easy to get seduced across to the other side. But I've been, like I said, incredibly lucky to always have a values alignment, to use my skills for you know, persuading people and communicating so that it has a positive impact on people's lives as individuals, but also as a community that we're living in. So if it's something you're interested in, I definitely recommend it. It's been fantastic throughout my whole career. So 20 years ago, when I started in this space in health promotion and, and social marketing, and, and that's, I, I use the terms quite interchangeably, and I think they are intrinsically linked. And the reason for that is that we're all looking at the systems that we can use to influence change with, with a marketing lens or with a broader health promotion lens. If you build the best program ever, the best intervention ever, without having that marketing comms approach, without being able to promote it effectively, communicate effectively to your partners and to your community that you're wanting to reach, then you're only ever going to have a really limited impact. And so they really do go hand in hand. So 20 years ago, when I was reflecting on this, it was all, all about talking to our audiences. And, and we didn't think about them as community and audience. It was very much using the language of a target audience, which sounds a bit odd these days, to be honest. When we talked about digital space, digital was really just your website. And the website was thought of really as a, as a library of everything you'd ever done. So there was no thinking about the user experience in that, what users and community wanted to hear from you. It was literally just every project that we'd done, every piece of work that we'd put out, we needed to load it onto the website and get it out there and, and that was job done. I spent a lot of time focusing on hard copy pieces, so brochures and magazines and newspaper advertising, and it was all one way, all broadcast. There was no social media when I started out. There was no real focus on listening and any feedback was confined, confined to focus groups, really specifically set up, really limited. People could get in touch uh, and send an email through, but you know, we responded and, and that was it. There was no proactive way of listening to what the community wanted to say. I think even in the last 10 years, social was, of course, has been here, but it was really still for broadcast and for pushing messages out, really using them as channels, just another version of a TV, a radio, a print advert. At best, we were listening because we were moderating for offensive comments, um, deleting where we thought that was the, the more important thing to do. But again, it wasn't really listening. It wasn't really two-way. It wasn't engagement. It wasn't taking a lead from the community at all. A couple of other things that just kind of stood out for me when I was reflecting back, uh, designing for mobile was an extra request. So when you had an agency designing a website, you had to specifically ask for them to design for, design for mobile first. It was an extra cost. It was an extra part of the project. It really didn't get thought about very often. And QR codes were a no-go. I distinctly remember an agency pitching in QR codes to us and the idea that people had to, first of all, have a smartphone, then they had to have the right app, then they had to know what a QR code was and which app to access. There were just way too many steps in the process. And then look at us now, the world has completely changed. So the last two years has seen a lot of change, of course. It's been challenging, it's been unprecedented, all of those words that we've heard time and time again. But it has really had an influence on the way we do health promotion, the way we do social marketing and has opened up a lot of opportunities. And really, I think the biggest one, the biggest theme in that is that it has shifted from talking to 
to talking with and really listening uh, and, and listening up front. So digital, of course, has grown. Uh, we've seen incredible growth in all sorts of ways in terms of the number of people that are online and who is online, the time we're spending online, the, the way we get online, so the devices and multiple devices that people access and what we do when we are online in that space. People's digital literacy and comfort right across the community has really shifted from 10 years ago, five years ago, I would say even two years ago, there's been a market jump. People also want and expect more. They expect more from, well, everyone really, but they expect more from governments. They expect more from not-for-profit sector. They expect to find out more about health in particular. Health as an issue has crept up or leapt up, in fact, the um, list of importance for people and how they prioritise it, which is really amazing to see and, and does open up a whole world of opportunities for us working in this space because people are suddenly interested, they're seeking more information, they're searching for more information about their health and how they can protect it. So we really need to jump on that. But the other element is that people want to say, especially young people, but, but really people across the community, they want to be more involved in the solutions of the future. They want to be more involved in the decisions that impact and influence their lives, their day-to-day -day lives, their future lives and their health and, and what that's going to mean for them and their families, their friends, their broader community. And that's something that's only going to get bigger into the future, I think. We also, my gosh, it's like an entire new language from when I started out in this space. We talk about multi-channel and integrated plans where we used to just talk about above the line and below the line. So it was like TV or website activities really and and that's just blown out of the water there's all sorts of channels that we can use these days we talk about co-design user generated content user experience user journeys we do have qr codes and we talk more about um, the poem model which sounds very uh, literary and exciting but i'll talk you through that in a little bit it's less literary a bit more technical but uh, provides a really fantastic opportunity for all of us. So jumping back, that kind of first theme of, you know, digital has only grown, just sharing a couple of stats here and conscious that this is from September 2020 and we're now, you know, almost right at the end of 2021. So there will be some updated stats, but not, and I'm not going to go through all of these either, but a couple of uh, ones to focus on. 92% of Australian adults are online on some kind of digital device. So it's really the vast majority of the Australian audience that you're able to capture through online channels these days, which again is just so different to what it was before and has grown in the last two years. The other bit is on the top right there that the amount of time we're spending online, which depending how you look on it, at it, is quite terrifying. But it's 94 hours online in a month for any individual. So it's a huge amount of time that we're spending in the online world, the online space. And again, that gives us opportunities to reach people and have conversations with people in that space. So what are we doing with all these hours that we're spending online? Well, a large amount of it is kind of socialising, I guess, but social media channels, communities, then there's sort of email and messaging. So we are communicating and um, conversing with lots of people as well as lots of brands and messages. So, again, an opportunity to reach people through that. The rest of the time is consuming entertainment. So videos, movies, games, media, music, sports. And, again, if you think about all of the opportunities to connect with people through those channels, all of the advertising that you see, these are all opportunities for us in health promotion space to communicate with the communities we want to reach for those 94 hours a month that they're spending online. So the POEM model is uh, what we talk about as paid, owned and earned media and the just again, the opportunities to reach people 
in a whole multitude of ways. So it used to be, so if we start with paid, it used to be, you know, TV, radio, press, and of course we still use those channels, but it has shifted more into the digital space of you can get display ads on websites, ads, of course, in your Facebook feed and Instagram, pre-roll videos. You can pay influencers, influencers on social, pay for your search terms, your ads to come up when people search for specific terms. So there's a huge, and they're just some examples. There's a huge array if you've got money that you can reach more and more people across more and more channels, which again is is great for us. When we talk about owned media, it is literally what you own as a brand or as an organisation. So it used to be pretty limited. Yes, you owned your website. I guess your office displays if you had windows, uh, your, your front office or reception if people were coming in. It wasn't much more than that. But these days you've got your blog, you've got your email databases, your social media pages, you might have apps and podcasts. There's a whole range of ways to be, you know, for, for very little money, you don't always have to have an ad spend, for very little money you, you control these channels and you're able to reach people. And then earned media is really word of mouth. It's always been word of mouth, but I guess that word of mouth has become a bit more sophisticated over the years. So it's yes, it's earning media coverage, but there are lots of different ways that you can get people, influential people with lots of followers talking about you, spreading your message on your behalf. So people can do guest posts if people are mentioning you online, sharing your content, Influencers that are free, so people that really just genuinely love what you're doing and are happy to talk about it is just amazing. Um, reviews on, on things that they've been to or events or information that they've interacted with that they've found really useful. So the, when we talk about integrated marketing, and this is just all of the digital stuff, of course, there is a, there's a whole world out there, a uh, whole world of options by which we can get our health promotion messages out to the communities that we really need to be talking to and with. So what does it mean for opportunities? There are a few things that I, I wanted to hone in on. What it means is that we can target people really effectively, much more than when you were just broadcasting in, in the good old days. You can target people based on their demographic or based on their behaviours. So demographic, you can target based on things like age, gender, location, language. And just as an example, This Girl Can, which is a Vic Health campaign that runs through Victoria. If you're not aware of This Girl Can, then you can head online, thisgirlcan.com.au. But effectively, it's about uh, providing support and encouragement for more women to get more physically active. So for that campaign, for example, we were targeting based on people being women, uh, 18 plus, but really honing in on a 25 to 45 year old audience, women living in Victoria, because that's where we're based, women living in lower socioeconomic, outer metropolitan regional areas, and also women who were speaking or reading sort of Arabic, Chinese, Punjabi, Sinhalese and Vietnamese. Now, all of that was based on data that we've got that shows the communities of women who are less likely to be getting the sufficient levels of physical activity. So what it means that we could, uh, I guess, stop wasting our money spending and reaching women who were already getting lots of activity in their day and really focus in on the women that we wanted to be talking to with this campaign. In terms of behaviours, you can target based on what people have liked, visited, searched. So again, using this girl can as an example, if people had searched things like beginner yoga or swimming lessons, that showed us that they were interested in getting started. They weren't super fit and sporty, but were wanting to start, perhaps wanting to find out how, and that's who we wanted to really inspire and motivate more with our messages. One of the other huge benefits is that you can measure and optimise in this world. You get data kind of up the wazoo. <laughs> you have so much data, your head can explode. Uh, but you can look at who you're reaching, 
sort of how many people and who with the activities you're putting out there, how, what's the engagement been like, how many people and who is clicking, liking, sharing, viewing, commenting, registering, downloading resources, all of that. You end up with numbers, spreadsheets that you don't know what to do with. The, the opportunity but the challenge is that you need to translate that into insights that help you optimise and improve what you're doing. So you can test alternative versions, for example. So if you've got an ad, a, a video versus a static image and you really want to test, you're not sure which one to go with, put them both out, see which one gets more responses, drop the dud and keep going with the one that's performing the best. You can update your creative and your messages. You can test different email subject lines, different colours, different types of images. You can use a humorous approach or a serious approach. And based on the data, you can be constantly improving the work that you're putting out there and making sure that it's really hitting the mark with the people that you're communicating with. Another area of that where we've seen some huge success at Big Health actually in the last year or so is looking at search activity. So the words that people are searching for, use those words in your website content, in any blogs, in any articles, and it means that it will be more and more easy for people to find your content and to engage with it and get the benefit from it. So there are some risks uh, to be aware of and to be across as well. So targeting is fantastic, but it can also limit your reach. So if you think about it, going back to the This Girl Can example, we have a population in Victoria. We've said we're only interested in reaching women, so we've cut our audience by 50%. We're only interested in women in certain areas, in certain age groups. Every time you put that targeting, more specific targeting, you're lower in your reach numbers. Now that all might be for good reasons, but just something to be aware of that you are reaching fewer and fewer people when you put those limitations in. Not everyone is on digital and I'll touch on this a little bit. It's one that I hope you walk away with as a, um, a key standout from today that digital is really important, but you need to think outside of digital as well and outside of technology as well. But I'll get to that a little bit later. The other piece is around what we talk about as a media multiplier effect. And in a way, it's about saying that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What we find, what I've found in every organisation, every campaign that I've ever run, is that you get the most impact when people see your message multiple times, it's kind of a no-brainer, but also through multiple channels. And that's the bit that's really interesting to me. And if you think about it, if you get served an ad four times in your Facebook feed, it might just feel a little bit repetitive. You scan past it and ends up being wallpaper. You don't really pay much attention. If you get it in your Facebook feed, you also see it on a tram or a bus when you're out and about in your day. You also hear it on the radio if you're driving somewhere and it's on the TV when you tune in for whatever live TV, Bachelor or whatever it might be um, that you're watching, it suddenly feels like it's everywhere. And so you pay more attention, it feels bigger, even though you've still only seen it four times. And so that multi-channel effect really has a bigger impact. So really thinking, yes, digital, but actually outside of digital as well is important. And then linked to the, the point about not everyone is on digital, there is an unequal participation in the online space and in technology. You can get skewed feedback based on who is participating in that space. And it's just something you need to be aware of. You typically hear the most from people who hate what you're doing and are the most vehement, the sort of keyboard warriors that are out there. Then you'll hear from people who really love what you're doing, but you're kind of preaching to the converted a little bit. The, the majority in the middle, you don't really hear from that much. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of that you don't 
I guess, have a knee-jerk reaction to, to what you're hearing when you are out in, that, in those spaces. So again, in terms of not everybody being on digital, so back to these stats, 92% are on digital, that's amazing, but there is clearly an 8% gap and that's what I wanted to talk about. Because when we're talking about that 8%, still, still really large numbers, you know, 2.5 million Australians are not online. And when we look at who they are, that's where it gets really worrying for me and I hope for you as well. It gets really worrying considering we're working in health promotion, typically the communities that we want to have an impact with are the communities that are listed here. So people that are born in non-English speaking countries who have moved to Australia, people who have lower levels of education, older Australians, Australians who have disabilities, Indigenous Australians, Australians living in remote areas and communities, and people who are experiencing homelessness. Now, if one, several or most of them are, are not being covered in terms of who you're trying to communicate with in a health promotion sense, I'd be very surprised um, because, unfortunately, these are, these are the people across our community who typically do have poorer health outcomes and that we do need to be working more with more closely. So, again, if we put all of our eggs into the digital basket, then we're probably missing a trick. So, again, that multi-channel approach, thinking about, yes, digital, but what else do we need to reach these people? couple of dangers. Um, targeting and algorithms are great, but they can cause harm. So I'm um, just going to read out this tweet that I came across from Professor Sandy O'Sullivan, who said, I'm also reminded of a time a few years ago where I was using Google to look up problem gambling, which was an issue for someone I knew. After that, Facebook sent me a lot of extremely pro-gambling ads. Imagine if I was that person. So you could be looking for information to quit smoking, to reduce alcohol consumption, but because you've included certain words, then the, the back end and the data means that you get served more ads that are actually undermining your health and your decisions. And that's pretty worrying. Again, uh, something that we should be concerned about. I know um, in the sort of Pregnancy space, if you're searching pregnancy and then you sadly have a miscarriage, your data is still showing that you are searching pregnancy. And so we might have been search, serving up some really helpful, positive health promotion messages about how to have a healthy pregnancy, but suddenly that becomes really triggering for that person who's experienced a pregnancy loss. So just some things to think about there. Do you have some negative matching of well, if the search terms haven't been super recent? that you might drop them out of the mix? Do you add in other, other negative search terms? So if they've searched term A, but they've also searched term B, maybe we don't want to target them anymore. It's just some, some things to think through. And the other example there, uh, a much less accidental, much more deliberate, uh, that four out of five ads shown to pro-Trump profiles, uh, next to posts about the attack on the US Capitol building, were selling tactical gear, which was clearly intended for combat. So encouraging that more violent behaviour and, and profiteering off that, which is pretty uh, horrendous. And that leads me into uh, the dark side. They're in this space as well. And it's something that we can never get away from. And something that you really need to think about in health promotion is how we counter the tactics of the harmful industries that, that are really all about profit but undermining the health and well-being of ourselves and our communities. So alcohol, gambling, the unhealthy food and drink industries, they're all over this space. They're often early adopters in terms of technology and digital and all of the new platforms that are out there. They tend to be more innovative and have a higher risk appetite, certainly than government. Um, you know, and there's very good reasons for that. We're spending taxpayer money. We need to make sure we've got some checks and balances in place. 
But likewise for not, the not-for-profit sector who are spending donor money and need to make sure that it's going to be effective. They, they have bigger budgets. There is a lack of really effective regulation, particularly in the digital space when it's changing all the time. It's really hard for regulation to keep pace. And, of course, our kids are particularly vulnerable. We don't really know what they're doing when they're online and they don't really have the sophistication to understand that what they're seeing is an advert that's trying to persuade them or that's trying to influence them, particularly if it's sitting within an online game and, and things like that. The harmful industries are also really quick to leverage trends and we've seen this in the last two years. I've got an example there from the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education. Alcohol promoted as a coping mechanism during COVID. We know that unhealthy food deliveries were discounted. So food delivery companies were putting the choosing to put the discounts on unhealthy foods, junk foods, instead of pushing perhaps pushing people into a healthier direction. So it is, I don't want to end on a downer. I've got a couple more slides to go, but it is something that we need to really focus on in health promotion. Uh, Vic Health has published a report on this recently. So if you wanted to jump on our website and I'll organize to uh, share these slides so you don't have to jot it all down right now, but uh, Vic Health forward slash under the radar, you can read more about it, specifically focusing on harmful how harmful industries target Australian children in the digital marketing space. So this is my, my two cents on where to next. Uh, two things that I think are absolute themes is that we'll continue to see growth and growth in lots of different senses, more people online, more time online, more channels, more spending in this space. What that means is that there's also growth in consumer knowledge and expectations. So more and more digital natives growing up and, and coming into this space, an increase in familiarity. Also, that means an increase in lack of trust, um, a higher concern for privacy, more ad blockers. So some of that targeting might become harder to do in the future and it would be really interesting to see what the speaker's this afternoon talk about in that space and in terms of cookies and what's changing in that space as well. But what does that mean for us and where we need to go and you as the future of health promotion and where you need to go and, and focus on and the skills that you really need to, to build? And for me, it's about building agility, making sure that we are able to move quickly as things come up, that we don't get so hung up and so uh, caught up in perfecting things and, and things taking so much time. Really trialling, being open to trial and innovate. So try something small, innovate, try something new because it might just be the new thing that has the biggest impact and really jumping on new things is important as well. And all of that combined with data Data, yes, but data-led insights quite specifically. So you can get bamboozled by all the data and all the numbers. You need to be able to analyse that and really understand what it means for you and what it means for what you can do in a more effective, more impactful way to have outcomes for community. And the other element is this, this idea of giving up more power. And it's something that I think we're still getting used to and getting better at. Again, this shift from talking to to talking with and taking the lead from our community. They want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of the decision making. And that's amazing. But enabled to do to do that, it's about giving up power yourself and allowing them in and really listening and really valuing what they have to say, valuing lived experience alongside academic experience and theoretical experience and, and combining them all to get a better outcome at the end of the day. And th this is my final slide, which is yes to lead into if you have questions, but I guess to kind of put it back on you and say, well, you're the, you're the future generations of health promotion and where it, where it goes and what it ends up being from here is really in your hands, which is pretty 
amazing not to put a lot not to put heaps of pressure on you but um an amazing opportunity and really exciting so uh yeah over to you but see if anybody has any questions thank you so much melanie yeah. that was such an interesting presentation and i'm sure it's given a lot of us a lot to think about as we enter our careers um we'll just do 10 minutes of questions if that's all good with you yeah, and if anyone has any questions post them in the comments section along the side of your screen uh, we'll just do them in order so does the continuous feedback from your audience affect the campaigns you design and whether you alter them at all um, depending on on that feedback yeah great question sophie and yes but I guess to my last point, it, I, it's something we're getting better at and that giving up control and really listening. And look, the other, part of the other change in the last two years is that audiences are getting much better at um, seeing and appreciating really rough content, user-generated content, things that are filmed on an iPhone, which has been the norm in COVID because no one could get a big production crew together to, to film a TV ad. And that's great because it means it's cheaper, it's quicker, it's easier, but it's also easier to change them if you're not getting a great response from people. But yeah, we've had, uh, we've got some kind of, we're, we're talking about, we call them content directors, but we're engaging particularly for our new initiative, Future Healthy, where we've got young people in the room with us helping to design the creative and really shifting what we, what we do and we're updating it quite frequently, which is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. Probably um, going into the next question, onto um, what you were just saying about the future healthy. Uh, so, which platforms or mediums for health marketing do you see growing and becoming more prominent in the future? So, mm. are, like, are there new, I guess, social media platforms and that kind of thing that are popping up that you're finding are useful? Yeah. Look, you you are the next generation. You've probably got your finger on the pulse a little bit more than me, to be honest. Uh, TikTok has been a really interesting one. Uh, we haven't put our toe in the water. And again, back to the, you know, harmful industries are really quick and they jump in there super quickly. Uh, government and, and not-for-profits and health promotion, less so. There are some brand risks in terms of protecting what you appear next to in, um, in some of those channels, which is why we've been a bit slower off the mark. So that's been an interesting one. There are new platforms popping up all the time. But, but the other element of it that I find really interesting, and again, back to that point that not everyone is on digital, is that some of the offline kind of old school channels are actually becoming a bit more important. Like we're having more conversations about libraries across the state and across communities and that there are particular community groups where that really is their hub and their connection point. And so having messages available through local libraries is quite important and quite effective. So really it, it's a bit of a mix, I think, and changing it up. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll just move on to the next question. So with using search history to design content, are there any risks um, in only being reactive to the current public health issues and what's being spoken about instead of being proactive? Yeah, great point, Baldwin. And I'd say yes, there is, um, and it's something to be balanced out. And you know, we need to respond to what the community are asking for, but at the same time, we need to be leading and influencing what the community are thinking and asking for as well. That's our role, right? So, yeah, that combination of both. I guess the way we've been using it is trying to ensure the language that we're using is more appropriate and are the terms. We can get a bit caught up in our own health promotion jargon and it's not really the way anybody outside of our four walls speaks. So making sure that, you know, things like exercise or physical activity or movement or getting active, that that's an interesting one in and of itself. But what terms are people really using and, and how can we shape that? But yeah, really good point. You need to respond, but also take the lead in this space. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got another good question from Ross. What do you see will be different about your role in 10 years, especially with technology constantly changing? I'm sure there'd be a lot. <laughs> oh, wow. So hard to think about. Uh, I'm I'm actually going on parental leave beginning of next year. So right now I'm thinking about what will the role be like when I come back in 12 months' time, let alone 10 years' time, but um, which is exciting in and of itself. 
Look, there's there's probably a whole lot of different factors involved in that and different angles to come at that question. Um, one is around ways of working and, you know, the fact that I'm tuning in from home at the moment and not in the office. And I think the, the hybrid model of working is not going anywhere. There have been real benefits to that. And so that will shape the work that we're doing. Digital and digital comfort, that 92% that should grow. Platforms will completely change. There'll be entirely new ways of interacting. And I think that, that letting go of control will be really interesting to see what that looks like. Our, our latest campaign model of co-designing the creative with young people alongside us has been really interesting, but it's been really different for us. And so what that might look like in the future when we hand that over more and more will be incredibly interesting to see. Yeah, yeah it's definitely it's too exciting. far to, to know who specifically. <laughs> no, it's exciting. It's exciting for us to think about as, as future public health healthers, public health yeah. professionals. You know, it's good. <laughs> um, and just the final question from Amir. Although technology makes your work more accessible, it will likely have to compete with other advertisers. So how do you make sure that your mm -hmm. message sticks? Yeah, absolutely. And more and more all the time because there are just more opportunities there's more and more noise and more white noise and so making sure that you you and your message really stands out is absolutely critical and that's what I like to think about as uh, in, in the social marketing space and that part of health promotion it's really a mix of art and science uh, there's a lot of evidence base and a lot of research that goes into the messages that we're putting out but there's also an element of you know, creativity and fun and working with agencies and creative young people and how you make it stand out and is it humorous and how does it really stop someone in their tracks and and there's no one size fits all it's different depending on who you're trying to reach what the message is about you know just the zeitgeist of where we're at in the community and in society and what's going to stand out at the time but that's the bit that I find the most fun that combination of the two of coming up with something exciting and new and creative that also responds to the evidence makes the work more challenging as well than uh, my pitch for using your powers for good instead of evil in a marketing sense it, it's more challenging that coming up with something creative that also has an impact in terms of positive health outcomes is really challenging, but it's so important and so great when you get it right. Yeah, for sure. I, I like how you said that there's the arts and the science side. I've always said that about public health. There's the STEM side and then there's the real arts side, which makes it makes it fun yeah. for us. Um, I might give a couple more minutes to see if anyone else has some questions to uh, pop through. But in the meantime, I've also written a little question. Um, you spoke about how media has shifted from being talking at the public and more one way to being more two way where you can interact more. Obviously, that's got heaps of positives for co-design and that kind of thing. But are there any real negatives to it or challenges with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, one which is probably a bit of a self-care shout out is that it can be really hard to hear some of the comments that come back. And when it's something that, you know, you're really passionate about, really close to, you've spent so much time on the work, you really love it and you've put it out and you've got the best of intentions and then it gets slammed and people uh, say horrible things and they can say really horrible things that can be really hard to, to listen to kind of personally. And so that self-care of, you know, having a bit of a distance, not, not reading every single comment, those sorts of things. Um, it's, it's hard to, I guess, sort the wheat from the chaff. As I said earlier, you get, you know, people who really hate it will comment the loudest, but that might only be, you know, 2% of people have that opinion. So it's important to not knee jerk react to that. The other part that's hard is just to keep across it all and you can't possibly see everything and that takes monitoring, takes time and it takes money, takes resource and so that's just something to be prepared for and to plan in as well. So definitely don't set and forget, put things out and then make sure you're checking how it's performing and how people are responding but that also means you've got to be prepared for that. Yep. 
Thanks for the advice. <laughs> Makes me want to do a comms degree. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for today, Melanie. This has been really great. We really appreciate on behalf of the MPGHSS and everyone at Unimel, we, we're really grateful for your time today. Very, very welcome. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And just for everyone else, we'll now just go to a bit of a break, get up, stretch your legs, make yourself a cup of tea, and we'll come back at 1.40. So we'll see you then.
Hey folks, welcome back. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us for our Kahoot. So I hope you've got your trivia caps on. We're going to have a big brained, you know, rapid fire round. We're going to see, you know, who truly is the, uh, dare I say, most knowledgeable public health student association member. So hang tight. Hey folks. We'll wait just welcome. a little bit longer and then we'll start again. Uh, we've got nine players. We'll just wait 30 seconds and then we'll start. So I hope your fingers are ready to click the correct buttons. Do a few warm-ups, you know, give them a few stretches, give them a few cracks, and we'll see how it goes. We've got some oh, interesting names, Amazing Horse, Royal Hawk, Rapid Falcon, lots of, lots of good stuff. Slowly people are joining in. We'll give you another, let's say, 20 seconds, another 20 seconds. Hope you've prepared for a big game, big game. This is how it happens. All right, there's a lot of us. We'll begin. So, hope you're all vibing to the Kahoot music. It's the best. Alrighty, which term refers to members of MPGHSS? Is it PH, is it pop stars, health citizens, or health students? Got 20 seconds to think this through. Alrighty, it was healthizens. Not bad, not bad. We'll go to the next question. Super Wombat, oh, looks like you're at the top. Amazing Horse, Royal Hawk, great stuff. Let's go. Number two, Nike, the symbol in the university's logo, is the go Greek goddess of what? Is it wisdom? Is it peace? Is it victory? Or is it hope? Alrighty, it was wisdom. Whew, only seven right answers. Let's see who's on the leaderboard. Oh, that big chat, Royal Hawk. And we'll just wait for a second for everyone to be up, and then we'll go next. Question three, which of these places are not in Australia? Is it Sausage Gully? Is it Yay? Is it Ding a Ding? Or is it Cape Cowwind? Pop those answers in. Lots of interesting names here. I don't know this one. No. I think it's, uh, I'm gonna put in Sausage Gully as my, uh, my guess on this one. Four seconds left, everyone. See the answer? Oh, Cape Falwood. Sausage gully. Oh, want to visit there someday. Let's see who's winning. Oh, Silly Llama. Look at that. On a hot streak. That's a highest answer streak. Good on you. Question number four. The built environment, education, and healthcare access are examples of what? Proximal determinants of health, social gradients of health, downstream determinants of health, or social determinants of health? Those are uh, those in the know in public health. This is a, uh, you know, this is your bread and butter right here. Twenty 
25 seconds. You need to think. Oh, social determinants. 13 new WhatsApp. Good stuff, Gabe. Next question. Giving Crane at the top. Great work. Next, question five. What does woman Jekka mean? Is it goodbye? Is it welcome? Is it hello? Or is it love? Oh, maybe that picture gives it away. I'm not going to lie. Rip. That's all right. We can all learn a new word today. 14 seconds left. Welcome. Correct. Let's see if it's scoreboards. Nothing changed. Shining Yak, you're still on an answer streak of four. Good work. Question six. MPGH double S is your friendly neighborhood student organization. What does it stand for? Is it the Melbourne Population and Global Health Student Syndicate? The Melbourne Population and Global Health Society of Students? The Melbourne Population and Global Health Secret Society? Or the Melbourne Population and Global Health Student Society? Of course, that's quite a mouthful if you ask me. Eight seconds left. The answer is, of course, the Student Society. And you all knew that. 17. Good work. Ooh, Silly Llama moving up. Good work. True or false, the terms pandemic, epidemic, and outbreak can be used interchangeably. Oh, everyone's very quick on that one. 16 answers in, 17 answers in. True or false? Ooh, that's all right. Two players just missed the false button. They accidentally clicked the true. All right, look at that. The scoreboard does not change. Next, question number eight. What does UNICEF's WASH initiative stand for? Water, sanitation and hygiene, water and sanitary health, world aid for sexual health of the wellness, activity, safety and health initiative. This one's, a, this one's a bit of a head scratcher, I'm not gonna lie. It's, you know, all seem like very valid answers. You know, could be an and in there, could be a proper word. It's, you know, this, is, this feels like a good multi choice question for an exam. Like sometimes you do like a little multi choice and you can tell the joke answer. But of course, it is the Water Sanitation and Hygiene Initiative. Good work, gang. Whew, scores have changed a bit. Expert Elephant and Super Wombat, you've moved up in the top five. Great work. Question number nine. Australia has an established treaty with Indigenous Australians, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Is this true or is this false? Eighteen seconds. Anyone still any of those little Google? Googling for the answers. The music's a pop, I'm not gonna lie. Four, oh, this was very close. Eight said false. That, of course, is correct. Now, just so you guys know that afterwards we'll ask the winner to pop by our student society at some point to collect their prize or just message us and we'll uh, get back to you. Question number 10. Who is the current Chief Medical Officer of Australia? Is it Brett Sutton? Is it Brendan Murphy? Is it Nick Coatsworth? Or is it Paul Kelly? It's not Paul Kelly, the health professional, not Paul Kelly, the musician. Easy mistake to make. I made that mistake once or twice as well. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize this musician's also a doctor. No, these are separate people. Very common name, Paul. Very Aussie name. And of course, the answer is Paul Kelly. Look at that. Good work, gang. Let's see how our scores are going. Now, at the end, just a correction. Whoever's whoever has won, just send us an email and we'll uh, send you out a little prize. So, Giving Crane, you're still in the lead. Good work. Question 11. According to the UN Development Report of 2019, which country has the highest life expectancy? Is it our very own Australia? Is it Switzerland? Is it Japan? Or is it Hong Kong? Once you 
ponder, want to ponder. UN Development Report 2019. Oh, only two people said Hong Kong. Interesting. Most people said Japan. I would have said Japan as well. So to those 11, don't worry, you're not alone. Nice. Lively duck, you're moving up to top five. Great work. Question 12. The University of Melbourne was founded in 1853. When was MPGHSS or MPHSA established? Is it February 28th, February 14th, February 24th, February 1st of 2001? 2001, 20 years. Not bad. Now, course members are older than that. Some even younger than that, I think. No, you still be a older than that. Wait a few more years. Three seconds left. Ooh, February 1st, 2001 is the right answer with three correct responses. Oh, expert elephant moving up, giving crane. You're gonna have to, you know, gonna have to put the pedal to the metal to catch up. True or false, MP, MSP, ooh, I think that was maybe, no, MSPGH, the Melbourne School of Population Global Health, was the first school of population health in Australia. True or false? No Google on this one. 15 seconds to, you know, flip a coin, basically. No false. Ooh, the answer, of course, is true. 14 of you knew that, or maybe guess that, we'll see. Oh, it's heating up. Expert Elephant, Giving Crane, Champion Raven, Silly Llama, and Champion Deer at the top. Let's go. Question 14. When was COVID-19 initially reported to the World Health Organization? Was it October 2019, November 2019, January 2020, or was it December 2019? Think back, think back all those months ago. How far away? Nine seconds left. Ooh, December 2019 was the correct response. Let's see what the leaderboard is. Oh, giving Cram going back up. Champion Deer, high answer streak of three. Great work. And let's now move on to our last question, number 15. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Wellbeing, the chronic disease that caused the highest burden in 2018 was mental and substance use disorders, musculoskeletal conditions, cancer, or cardiovascular diseases. The answers are popping in a bit slower, so I think you guys are really, you know, stumped by this question. So, uh, you know, a lot to think about. I mean, they're pretty, pretty decent guesses. I think this isn't like a short answer because uh, well, I would not have no idea what to write. Multiple choice question, that's the way to go. And like any degree, that's what you do. Ooh, it was of course cancer. All right, gang. Let's see what the score is. On the podium, coming third with nine correct questions was Silly Llama. Great job. Coming second with 11 correct questions was Expert Elephant. And of course, coming first, also with 11 correct questions, is Giving Crane. So whoever's Giving Crane, send our team a message, uh, you know, give us a little shout out, and we'll talk about giving you a little prize to send out. Great work. Just take a quick little break, and then we'll be back with our three minute thesis. Stay around.
All righty, we are back and we're going to start with our three minute thesis. So the way that it works is we're going to highlight, spotlight one of our presenters. They'll talk about the research that they've been doing. They've got three minutes to talk about it. And then afterwards, if there are any questions, we'll just throw them at them. So to start off with, we will go with Lily. Lily, hello. Hello, is my mic working? Your mic most certainly is working. I can hear you loud <laughs> and clear. Yeah. You know, we get a good view into your background. I like your bed sheets. I'll message oh, you later. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit like that with Zoom. You see everyone's bedrooms and that kind of thing. But... It's the best. I like to like pin like someone's profile and like look at what they have on their shelves. Like, what are you reading? Do you still have Harry <laughs> Potter on your shelf? That's embarrassing. You're an adult. Time to move on. That's why you have them above the computer so no Absolutely. one can see. I like do the blur background. I don't like the blur background because that's like. What are you hiding? To... Say again. <laughs> If you've got a blurred background, what are you hiding? Exactly, exactly. It's just like that <laughs> temptation. It's like, I want to know what is going on. Anyway, I'll start my three-minute timer. Do you have a slide or would you like to talk just off the cuff? Happy just to talk. Um, I thought too short for slides and that kind of thing. like it a lot. All right, well, okay, your three minutes start now. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. As you've heard, my name is Lily and I'm a Master of Science Epidemiology student. So I completed my research capstone this year under supervision from Dr Fiona Bruinsma and Associate Professor Alison Hodge from the Cancer Council Victoria. So thank you very much to them for all of their guidance this year. Uh, my second semester project was a data analysis from the CONFIRM case control study. CONFIRM in investigates risk factors for renal cell carcinoma, or RCC, which is a common type of kidney cancer. But my project was more focused on the association between fruit and vegetable intake and RCC in particular. There's a lot of interest in this area because RCC rates are increasing, but they also vary widely around the world, which indicates to us that modifiable lifestyle risk factors may play an important role in RCC incidence rates. We did this project to fill a gap in the literature. The current literature has yielded inconsistent results and it's also quite outdated. Uh, the most recent primary study was published in 2013. Our project in the first semester was a systematic review and meta-analysis on the same topic and that identified the need for this particular data analysis. So this was a large case control study. We had 1,107 cases and they came from Victorian and Queensland cancer registries uh, and that was between 2010 and 2015 and 757 sibling or spouse controls. Participants were asked to fill out health and lifestyle questionnaires, including a food frequency questionnaire, which was sort of our main um, piece of interest. Uh, and that had 22 fruit items and 32 vegetable items. Uh, so a lot of data cleaning needed to be done, but once this was complete, we ran unconditional logistic regression models. These investigated the association between RCC and fruit consumption, and RCC and vegetable consumption. And we adjusted for appropriate combinations of age, sex, smoking status, BMI, and the reciprocal of the exposure, so fruit or vegetables. These confounders were identified using DAGs. Uh, so the output of our models provided us with significant results for all models, including vegetables as our exposure. There wasn't much difference in the results uh, whether we additionally adjusted for BMI or for fruit intake. However, we found no significant results for models with fruit as our exposure variable or for any of our sub-analyses, and these were citrus fruit, cruciferous veg, or green leafy vegetables. We may have found a result for vegetables and not for fruit due to certain nutrients contained in vegetables, such as specific vegetable fibres, uh, but it's also possible that we didn't see enough variation between our cases and controls in this particular study because of the recruitment, because we had sibling and spouse controls, and they would probably be more likely to share a diet with the case than if controls came from the general population. So in conclusion, this data analysis found a significant association between vegetable intake and RCC, but these results were not strong enough to warrant any changes to existing healthy eating or nutritional guidelines. Thank you. Three minutes. That's a good job. Now, I'm going to ask a very silly sounding question. You said you adjusted for citrus fruits, for green leafy vegetables, and what was the middle vegetable type that you adjusted for? Oh, no, sorry. That wasn't the adjustments. Those were our sub-analyses. Oh, what was we the middle one? Uh, the middle one was cruciferous vegetables. What does that mean? 
I'm not entirely certain. There's a specific <laughs> definition that uh, nutritional epidemiologists are all over. It's certain types of leaves and that kind of thing. It's something to do with the nutrients in them. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I'm not 100% across those definitions. Fair enough. So do you reckon that because your research just focused on, say, dare I say, the Australian context, do you reckon you might find something different It was focused on a different nation? Uh, there's been a lot of different case control studies around the world. Um, and I think in European populations is generally where they're finding the significant results. Um, but, yeah, I think they have had case control studies in various different settings around the world. Hmm, fantastic. So what I'll do now is I'll highlight another speaker. And if anyone has questions, pop them in the chat. Lily, I'll ask you to stay on in the background. And if we have some, some other questions for you, we'll uh, pop you back on. Thanks for speaking. Thank you. We'll now pop on Darren. Darren, are you with us? Hi, yes, I am. How's it going today? Good. How are you going? Good. Now I'm seeing, oh, you've got a nice crisp background. It's all white, so I can't see a, you know, details. It's actually my toilet. Toilet. Well, there we go. See, you know, doors are mysterious. Like anything can be behind them, right? So it's yes, pretty, uh, pretty vital. So I'll start my timer soon and you've got three minutes. All right. And Thank again, you. I've I'll actually order. got a presentation. Can I just share it like on my present? screen, please? Yeah, yeah of course. You. I'm just sorry, just trying to figure out Take how to your use time. this. No rush. Are you able to see that? Yep. Yeah, All right. Great. Your three minutes starts now. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, hi, my name is Darren. Uh, I'm from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the University of Melbourne. And today I'll be presenting our COVID vaccine preparedness study. So to vaccinate or not to vaccinate COVID vaccine intentions amongst priority groups in Victoria. We conducted a mixed method study with Victorians who were prioritized to receive COVID vaccines in the early phases of rollout um, earlier this year. So this included surveys, um, interviews, as well as co-design focus groups. We wanted to understand the vaccine intentions, concerns, information needs, as well as decision-making factors in order to develop clear and actionable guidance to promote the uptake and acceptance of COVID vaccines. And we have two study groups, um, that being healthcare workers, as well as what we term the prioritized public which were um, adults aged 70 years and older or younger adults with a chronic medical condition. I'll jump straight into um, our survey results and just the main findings, just because we don't have much time today. But we saw that um, 78% of healthcare workers, as well as 87% of members of the prioritized public intended to get vaccinated. And people who identified as male, um, living in a metropolitan area, as well as speaking English at home, were more likely to get vaccinated. Now, we also saw that there were three main concerns, that uh, being safety, long-term effects, as well as serious reactions. We also asked um, respondents to um, identify whether they felt that they were fully informed about um, five topics related to COVID vaccines. So this included recommendations, how they work, how effective they are, their safety profile, as well as any side effects. And only 27% of people felt that they were fully informed. And this is really important because people who felt fully informed were seven times more likely to get vaccinated or to recommend the COVID vaccine to their patients. We also sought to understand what factors actually influence people in getting the COVID vaccine. So in both groups, we saw that vaccine safety and efficacy data from trials, as well as a requirement of the COVID vaccine to travel overseas was strongly associated with um, people wanting to get vaccinated. In healthcare workers specifically, um, a recommendation by their professional society or the availability of um, vaccines at their workplace were strongly associated with wanting to get vaccine. Now, in terms of communications, people preferred um, to hear uh, about their COVID vaccine information from government websites or sources, as well as a discussion with their healthcare providers. They also indicated that they trusted medical professionals and scientists or researchers the most. With all of our study findings, we came up with 11 recommendations for the Victorian government's um, vaccine comms campaign. So this included communicating clearly about vaccine safety and effectiveness, what are the expected side effects, what's the benefits of vaccination, also highlighting the severity of the disease itself um, to counter that wait and see approach, um, and also clearly communicating about vaccine availability. It was also important to provide personalized information, for example, 
um, due to high risk groups such as medical conditions or age groups and uh, providing messages from real trusted people as well as materials which were clear, simple and shareable. Healthcare workers also indicated that they wanted resources to support them in having discussions with their patients. Finally, it's important to build trust by being transparent and um, to use vaccine requirements such as vaccine mandates judiciously. And really um, quickly, just uh, where on next, just because, you know, we've gone to about 90% of first doses here in Victoria. So, of course, it's important to continue with existing campaigns, especially targeting um, those who have still not been vaccinated, um, even at this stage, and also further support for um, healthcare workers. It's important to have ongoing community engagement, for example, by um, training vaccine champions within communities so that they can um, you know, counter misinformation and promote the vaccines uh, within their own communities. And also important to understand that not all um, under vaccination is due to um, vaccine hesitancy, but there are um, remaining access and barrier issues that need to be overcome. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Darren. I've got Thank a question you. for you. On your data, you showed that healthcare workers had a, I guess, increased rate of vaccine hesitancy. Why do you think that is? Um, I, I would say that uh, with healthcare workers, it was actually about 78% um, wanted to get vaccinated. And then there was about 14% unsure and 8% um, that did not want to get vaccinated. So this was earlier on, um, I guess, uh, around February to March when we still, I guess we passed the second wave here in Victoria, but then we hadn't gone into lockdowns four, five and six, the subsequent ones. Um, and we also had a look at, um, so there was that wait and see approach uh, back then. And because not so many people had gotten vaccinated um, at that stage and, you know, all the clinical trial um, data was um, quite fresh, I think there was quite a bit of um, hesitancy, some reluctance in getting vaccinated just because of all this, um, you know, unsure feelings. Uh, but we also had a look at, I guess, the different types of healthcare workers. And we saw that um, personal support staff, for example, those working in residential and disability age, um, disability care, uh, they had the highest um, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, and for example, um, medical doctors, they, they were most willing to get the vaccination. So it was a mixture of, um, I guess, uh, their uh, profession, the setting that they worked in, uh, but also uh, because of that wait and see approach earlier on this year. Fantastic. And this study obviously was more focused on COVID-19. Uh, do you know if the literature suggests that your findings are similar to other vaccinations as well? Uh, other vaccinations. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about other vaccinations, but uh, we do know that, uh, of course, there's vaccine hesitancy with um, with any vaccine. Uh, but given that COVID vaccines, as we all know, um, was you know quite quite rapidly developed. Not that uh, it took uh, it cut corners or anything, but it was just rapidly developed. And I guess um, a lot of people were, or uh, some still are, um, very hesitant to get it because of again that unsure feeling. Uh, but I guess um, vaccine hesitancy in the COVID vaccine um, landscape is quite different uh, just because of the speed and because we're living right in the middle of a pandemic and with all mandates coming and all of that stuff. Um, it's just quite different, I would say. But again, uh, just answering your question again, in terms of how it relates to vaccine hesitancy with other vaccines, I'm not entirely sure. Fair enough. Thanks for chatting to us, Darren. And again, Thank if you. someone sends a comment question later for you, I'll bring you back in. Sounds good. Thank Thanks you. so much. Next up, we have Eunice. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I get to see a bit into your background. I see that lovely painting over there. Did you draw that yourself? Yeah, yeah. I draw it by myself. Fantastic. A researcher and an artist. We, you know, you're covering everything. <laughs> Thank you. Now, would you like to share a slide or do you wish to chat? Just... Uh, I can just, yeah, chat. Yeah. All righty then. Your three minutes, minutes starts now. You're more than welcome to start whenever you'd like. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eunice, and I'm a Master of Public Health student um, in 2021. And my research project is to uh, investigate the cross-sectional and longitudinal association of body composition with chironin pathway and metabolites and traditional markers of inflammation. So obesity is now being recognized as a metabolic disorder due to accumulation of abnormal excess fat, and it is characterized by low-grade systematic inflammation that threatens people's health. Um, 
Obesity is one of the most prevalent diseases in the world. Globally, 2 billion people are overweight. Of those, 650 million people are obese. In Australia, in every three adults, two are overweight or obese. So obesity is a condition where adipose tissue accumulated. Adipose tissue emerge as active tissue, which produce and release a variety of adipokins, as well as pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines. The increased level of pro-inflammatory markers triggered by adipose tissue have been implicated in the development of many um, metabolic diseases. And recently, there has been growing evidence that chirine markers derived from the tryptophan cat catabolism have particular role in inflammation and immune response. Uh, so my uh, research project is to um, investigate what is the link between obesity and inflammatory markers in the Kyuni pathway. And this was investigated in a sample of 976 participants in the Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study. Um, this, st this study's exposure were anthropometric measures, and the study's outcome were gen general inflammatory markers and Kyuni markers. For this study, we conducted two major analyses. One is cross-sectional to assess association between inflammatory markers and the several anthropometric measures at baseline and follow up separately. Another one is longitudinal analysis to assess the change in anthropometric measure and plasma concentration of chiruni markers. We use linear regression models to conduct this analysis and we adjusted for different confounders. And such as physical activity, socioeconomic status, alcohol consumption, and dietary habits. Uh, so for the results, most of the community markers show positive association with all anthropometric measures in both at, base, at both baseline and follow-up analysis. Um, and there was stronger association for many community markers compared with general inflammatory markers. So for implication, uh, we can uh, free, um, Kyuni markers can be a predictor in the future uh, chronic disease uh, uh, clinical trials or um, prevention. And from this study, we can conclude that Kyuni markers have positive and strong association with uh, asymptomatic measures. And for future recommendation, more studies can continue to explore the biological process of Kyuni markers and how they play a role in the chronic disease. Thank you. Fantastic. That's pretty interesting stuff. Tell me, what do you think is kind of like the, uh, you mentioned the implications. What do you see as future kind of applications or translations of your research? What else can we do with that? Uh, so this is quite a new area as um, these markers are not well studied. Mm -hmm. And um, from my study, they kind of show like a st strong like prediction in obesity induced inflammation. So in f future implication, um, they could be predictors of um, how um, people get inflammatory responses. So that could be interesting part to be investigated on. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for chatting to us. Uh, again, if anyone does have any other questions, please send them through. And again, if we have others come through, we'll get you back in. Thank you so much for chatting to us, Thank Eunice. You. All right. Next, we have Shinbat. Hello. H Hello. How's it going today? I'm going to do good. Thanks. Now you've got a nice clean white background, so I can't see too much into your background, although I also have a clean white background. So, you know, we're even on that front. Do you have any slides you'd like to share? Or would you like to chat off yes, the bat? I got a slide. Fantastic. So um, when you share them, I'll put okay. them up on the screen. All right, it's all yours when you're ready. Do you see the screen? Absolutely. Great, thank you. I'm Chimba Tashpil. My research topic is the effects of low carbohydrate ketogenic diet on obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease risk factors. My research <clears throat> today, our major public health problem is being overweight and obese. Obesity is a strong risk factor for various chronic conditions such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, heart diseases, and in cancer. Since 1975, the global obesity rate has nearly tripled. In Australia, every two out of three adults are overweight or obese. 
let's look at these photos. The first photo is 1960s, the second photo is in 2013. The question is, why are we getting more and more fat and diabetic regardless of the huge efforts by governments and health organizations? Today, health practitioners are lacking effective weight loss diet intervention programs to manage this continuously growing problem. So what causes obesity? These two models explain the underlying cause of obesity. The first model shows that obesity causes high calorie consumption and low physical activity. So it says eat less, move more to lose weight. Unfortunately, obese people don't respond well to this conventional model. The second model is the carbohydrate insulin model. This model explains carbohydrate hour consumption leads to weight gain through surging blood insulin levels, which is the main fat storing hormone. Based on this model, restricting carbohydrates reduce the insulin level as well as body weight. According to our literature review on ketogenic diet, we found that ketogenic diet induces more significant weight loss compared to the conventional high carbohydrate low fat diet. Even if people consume higher calories than the control group, they still lost more weight on ketogenic diet. Also, our study found reduced insulin and improved cholesterol levels on ketogenic diet. Why? It's mainly about insulin. Carbohydrates significantly increases blood insulin, however, protein and fat have a little or no effect on blood insulin. Lastly, our study suggests that carbohydrate restriction is effective to reduce blood insulin level and lose weight rather than caloric restriction. Eating fat doesn't make you fat, but carbohydrates do. Fat gives you more energy without affecting the blood insulin level, increases feeling of being full, and which reduces our eating. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. That was really insightful. So what do you reckon is kind of the future translation of your findings? Yeah, our study suggests a um, carbohydrate insulin model based dietary recommendations. It means um, it prioritizes uh, low glycemic um, foods rather than restricting calories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, low glycemic foods mean, means high fat and high protein, but uh, low carbohydrate. Gotcha. So more kind of bacon and eggs, less cereal type of thing going on. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll keep that in mind when I'm next making my brunch. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. All righty. And next we have Fikri. Fikri, how's it going? Oh, I don't think I can fully hear you. Unless I'm the one on mute. No, I can hear. That's all right. This, this is just part of the internet technology age. I can lip read you. I can't hear you. Do you want to try again? Let's see. Edit mic settings. No, can't do that. Nah, we still can't hear you. Sorry, mate. We can we can see us as this one. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. There we go. Right. Problem. How about the background oh. music? Is it too loud? No. Nah. Nah. What's the background okay. music? Uh, I think it's. Uh, I can't remember her name. His name. Sam Smith. Sam, classic. <laughs> classic. <laughs> I saw them live. I saw them live. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, do you have slides or would you like to talk off the cuff? I do have slides. I'll try to share. But Fantastic. I can just share screen. Yep. Share screen. We'll what up. you can see now. Oops. Uh, hasn't popped up yet. No, not entire screen. Window. Beautiful. There we go. All right. All right. Your three minutes when you're ready, you can begin when you'd like. Beautiful. Thank you, PGHS, for the opportunity as well. So this is a research collaboration between the Melbourne University and Northern Health. 
with the topic of the effective communication strategies for migrant and refugee, an overview of systematic review. So we have two challenges. We know that even though vaccine is really important, have a big impact to uh, for vaccine preventable diseases, but there's an increase of anti-vaccine sentiment. We saw protests and everything all around the world. The top three consistent reasons given is first, because of the vaccine safety concern itself, lack of knowledge and awareness and religious and cultural beliefs. And there's even though this general population have that issue, there's another group that hard to reach, including the migrant and refugees group. So we realized research found that communications can be a tools, can be a determinants as well to tackle anti-vaccine sentiment. But which one? There's a lot of communication strategies out there. There's multi-component interventions, incentives, education, reminder or recall system. That's how we come up with our research questions, like which one the most effective communication strategies for migrant and refugees. So we decided to do overview of systematic review because there are already a lot of systematic reviews out there. So we searched five different databases. We got 468 articles and we only included nine systematic reviews based on our inclusion and exclusion criteria that you can see on the right of uh, the slide. And the result is pretty much you can actually see, but it's really interesting. First, so if you could, just to let you know, you're not on presenting mode, you're just showing the um, PowerPoint application. Sorry? You're just showing the PowerPoint program. Yeah, now the slide's moved. All right. So which slide you can see now? Uh, now we can see slide number two. <laughs> so this is the numbers. So from, no, should I read sharing? Uh, you, can, you can change it to presentation mode if you want. I did this. The slideshow. Can you see the slideshow? We're only seeing the when you make the PowerPoint. We're not seeing the presenter mode. All right. I'll just stop sharing. Sorry, guys. That's Never right. used Hopkins before. Not have we. It's the first time for everything. <laughs> Share screen. Window. There you go. Can you see the full screen? Yes, or not? absolutely. Beautiful. So I told you cool. earlier, we shared five different databases. That's our inclusion and exclusion criteria there. So we decided only the one that published since 2012. It's because that's when the WHO Sage Working Group officially defined what is vaccine, vaccine hesitancy. And that become our limitation as well in this research. And we only included English languages. So maybe in the future, if someone wants to do further research, you can do uh, extension of the limitation of the timeline, also more like not only English languages, but we included only nine systematic reviews with the result, as you can see on the slide. So it is important if you want to do communication strategies for migrant and refugee, first you involve the community. It's good if you can start like with co-designing, so involve them in designing the vaccination project itself. And then apparently a lot of uh, migrant and refugee sees family influences as a really strong influence for vaccine update and they prefer like educational campaign. And this educational campaign must be provided in cultural and linguistic tailored messaging by a health professional. So they prefer a health professional that talk to them rather than just a community ambassador. So community engagement a person. So they prefer a health professional that can speak in their language, that understand their culture in the specific messaging. And they prefer the, the effective one that will increase the vaccine uptake is a multi-component intervention. So not only just one interventions, but it'll be more effective if you combine them with several uh, interventions. The one that's really interesting that we found and related as well to our theme for this conference is the use of technology. Apparently the use of text message or keychain reminder have limited effectiveness compared to you go there and invite them to the community centers rather than just giving them a text message. And then the use of health centers utilization and the provision of in incentive apparently have limited effectiveness as well. But uh, I mentioned before, there's a limitation of our finding. First, there's the population bias. There's no standardized definition of the hard to reach commun uh, community or which one that you can consider migrants, which one that you consider refugees. And uh, from the nine included systematic review, we only find uh, low to moderate confidence based on our uh, quality assessment and there's a lack of comparator. By conclusions, we decided that vaccination should not be provided in isolation. You cannot only see that vaccination, you go to a place, vaccinate people and that's done, but it's more like comprehensive, holistic, integrative approach where to answer the research question itself, we found that the effective communication strategy is the one that provided with cultural and linguistic tailored messaging by trusted experts as a source of information with community involvement. 
moving forward, future research still needed with consistent approach to measure the outcomes. Thank you, Ross. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Vikri. And thank you, everyone, for chatting to us. Really insightful, really fantastic to see the research being done by our school. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, all of our fantastic three-minute theses. And just to let you know, we'll be in touch and we'll send you out some little gifts of appreciation. So now to our audience, you guys have a bit of time to just hang out, you know, grab some water, go for a little walk. And we'll be back here at 2.40. So maybe come at like 2.37 or something like that. And at 2.40, we'll have our student think tank. Thanks, everyone.
Hello, everybody. I'm Amir, your epidemiology student representative. Um, for the next session, we'll be going to, we'll be going to have a student think tank, uh, and it will be facilitated by Dr. Sandro De Maio, the CEO of Vic Health. Along with him will be Kevin Kapeke, who is also an engagement officer with Vic Health. If you have any questions for them or any of the students, please feel free to send them through in the chat. Thank you. Hello. We live. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, You're live. We are live, right? Yeah. Awesome. All right. G'day, team. My name's Sandro. This is Kevin. Uh, we'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the land that we're on here in uh, Spencer Street, West Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. Acknowledge that this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And really importantly, give a shout out to any uh, Aboriginal students um, or First Nations students uh, from uh, that, that are tuning into this. Um, super excited to be here. Um, I feel like we're hosting some sort of TV show, Kevin. It's very exciting. Um, but yeah, awesome to be able to join you guys. Um, and uh, we've got four incredible people to hear from. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is this is an opportunity um, for students who undertook the PPU, which is the professional placement unit, to discuss essentially how their last two years have unfolded um, and the future of our sector, the public health sector. Um, each speaker will have about five to ten minutes with a chance for quite out there all joining you now with a chance for questions in the chat. Um, so please, we would like our guests this to be a, a nice little conversation and ask about your experiences and how they impacted, I guess, their thinking and their studies. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. I think as a person of colour, it is always very vital to do so and to imagine what kind of society we could be if all of us um, acknowledged our traditional owners. So without further ado, I am going to introduce um, Sander, who's going to be speaking first. And yeah, please put your questions in the chat and we'll go from there. Sander, over to you. Thanks for that intro, Sandra and Kevin. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Sander and I just finished my MPH this semester. And I came into the MPH with a Bachelor of Science. I majored in Physiology and I also did a Diploma in Languages in German. So when I started the MPH, I didn't have a specific pathway that I wanted to follow. So I just chose the subjects that interest me and I ended up specialising in epi and biostats, which I was really happy about because it um, meant that I could use those quantitative skills that I gained um, across lots of different public health issues because I wasn't particularly interested in one issue at the start and I wanted to get sort of a broad overview and be unrestricted in what I can um, uh, look into. So as said before, I did do the PPU capstone and I did my placement at Australian Red Cross Life Lab and I was based in the donor research team. And my research was um, around older donors, so donors aged 70 and over and the predictors of them donating during the pandemic specifically. And I wanted to understand what sort of um, factors influence donors to donate or to not. So for example, last year, you might have seen the federal government did release public health advice to Australians or to everyone in Australia aged 70 and over um, to stay at home as much as possible. So Lifeblood supported that advice. And we wanted to look at how that influenced donation, but also how that influenced them returning back to the donor centre. And this is really important because even though they're quite a small cohort um, compared to the rest of all the donors, they donate the most frequently. And so they provide that really stable source of blood supply. And that's just critical um, for our healthcare system. So I really did enjoy this and particularly doing it through the PPU, it was great to see that there's, there's a really practical element to the research that I was doing. Um, really practical application of the findings, so for example, I got to write a business report that um, went to the exec team and that was also given to the communications team and all of the recommendations that I made based on the findings are being rolled out now, just in terms of what sort of communication methods to use to this cohort. And it was also just nice to see all the other projects that are going on um, within Lifeblood. They've got a huge R&D um, 
team. So it's really great to hear about what they're doing. And also a lot of the researchers are, um, have a lot of extensive experience in other fields. I also, uh, so that was the biggest practical element of my MPH, which was really, um, really quite inspiring. But I also got to do a bit of contact tracing, as I know a lot of people in the cohort have been able to do. And that's been really great to apply that sort of, um, that theoretical knowledge that we gain, for example, about infectious disease transmission, using that knowledge in practice to help um, prevent the spread of COVID throughout our community and that was really rewarding and felt like it was really nice to contribute to um, society while still studying. Um, and then in terms of the future, I am next year moving up to Canberra, which I'm really excited about moving up to the capital. Um, I'm, I've been offered a role as a graduate consultant in change management at KPMG and it's not public health specific, but because it's in Canberra, it is working with a lot of the federal um, uh, governmental departments. So a lot of the work that's going to be done is working with the public sector. And so I'm really excited about seeing how the private and the public sector um, can work together to come up with some great projects. And because of the pandemic, but also a lot of other things that have gone on, for example, the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety, um, a lot of these really topical health issues, um, I'm going to be working on them. So I'm really excited about working in this space and bringing in my quantitative skills, um, uh, bringing the public health lens to the private sector and the work that I'm doing. So yeah, it looks like it's going to be a really great journey in the future and I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks, Sandra. That sounds amazing. Congrats on the gig too in Canberra. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I'll kick off. We're waiting. Please do, if you have questions, post those in the comments section. Um, I'll kick off a question which dates back to when I was a medical student myself. And um, there was always this kind of tension between learning epidemiology and studying medicine. And I remember a lot of people used to say, you know, why... Um, why do we need to learn epidemiology? How is that related? Why don't we just learn, you know, more uh, anatomy? Um, I mean, we brought more broadly than just medicine. I mean, how how do you see um, the role of epidemiology helps you as a leader or um, outside of your, you know, your skill, your core focus of public health? How do you think it's going to help you even in your new role in thinking about things like complex change management? Yeah, I think epidemiology, like it's quite structured and quite methodological. And I find that the process that you take to um, do whatever research you're doing, um, that sort of structure you can bring on into other parts of work that you're doing. And for me, that's really how I work as a person. I really like to be quite, um, yeah, I like to have my steps and my to-do list. And I feel like Epi really supported that. I just think that it's really important also to have that quantitative element to everything that you're mm -hmm. doing. You need to make sure that all the decisions you're making are grounded in 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 research and in in fact. Um, obviously, I really do like qualitative research as well, but I, I have a little bit of a um, bias for quant. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. Thanks, Sandra. That was great. Uh, Kevin. Um, yes, Sandra, you mentioned um, during your work at Red Cross, you were trying to figure out some of the um, best communication methods for that um, 70 plus um, cohort. What are some, I guess, um, high level insights you have about communicating mm -hmm. with this age group? Yeah, great question. So I'll just go on to what the research I did was. So there were some communications that were sent out to these donors to not come in and donate, which is actually. Um, can be quite a sensitive topic because these people are giving their time to donate, giving their their blood, literally giving themselves, um, and it, telling donors to not date, donate can have that negative impact on donor retention in the long run. And so there were a few communication methods that were used. An email was sent out. Um, there were text messages that were sent out and there was a phone, uh, a couple of phone calls as well. And donors received a survey and I 
looked at um, which donors ended up uh, stopping donating due to these communication methods. So we found that the SMS wasn't actually a very good communication tool to prevent donors from donating during this period. Um, but the phone call was and the email was. Um, and why that is, I hypothesise that people in this age group, they don't open their emails on their phone. Like, you know, it's probably you sit down at your computer and you read it and you digest it, whereas with the SMSs, it's a bit, yeah. I mean, I didn't look that far into it. But yeah, the email on the phone was the best. Um, but so there was the issue with people not coming back. So mm. having to, yeah, they're going to have to figure out a way to communicate to donors to make sure they do end up coming back. And so that was kind of the key finding there. Awesome. We, we're going to be, we're going to have to keep time, but we, there's one very quick question. Can we ask you, Sandra, from Sophie? who is asking, do you think pub the public perception of epidemiology has changed uh, with the pandemic? Wow, it's even on the screen there, it's so technological. Um, so the question's there for you, what do you think? I don't think anyone knew what epidemiology was before the pandemic. Like everyone thinks they're an epidemiologist on the couch nowadays, you know, so you see Tony <laughs> Blakely up there every day on the projects. Like, yeah, I think it definitely has. And that's really, really cool because I think it's important that people are aware of um, the work that goes on behind the scenes with public health and that we need this sort of like evidence-based practice and behind the policy that goes out there. So yeah, I think it has changed a lot and but positive. Awesome. Thanks, Sandra. That was awesome. I, I always um, joke that when I did my PhD in epidemiology, uh, everyone thought it was insects. Um, and uh, now, as you say, everyone thinks they're an epidemiologist. So the world has definitely changed uh, in some ways since, uh, yeah, since a while ago when I did my PhD. Uh, awesome, Sandra. Next we have um, Hugh Varley. Over to you, Hugh. Good day, everyone. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Awesome. I might just share my screen if that's okay. Now let me know if you can uh, if you can see that screen. Okay. We can't see the screen yet, but um, I'm sure that the techno magic people will make something happen in a moment if it's going to happen. Um, have we shared screens before? You know, Hugh. Uh, not on this platform, and it's a little ironic that this is a oh, session about a technology. Hi guys, sorry. Um, okay, cool. Hello. So on the bottom, you should have the share screen button. So if you want to click that. And yeah, then you can so I've done that. Share the screen you want, and then basically just add it to the podcast. Mm. So just waiting for you to do that, and then I'll add it. Loving your mo, by the way, Hugh. Oh, thank you very much, yeah, all for a good charity. Listen, you know what we'll do? We we might skip the um the share screen. I think just in the interest of time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm more than happy to talk to it. So um, right. can I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which I'm on today, the Rwundjeri people of the Kula Nation, where I am here in St Kilda, and acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so today, what I thought I might talk about a little bit is my own PPU. So I was doing um, work over 20 weeks with Origin Youth Health, and also maybe talking a little bit um, just in terms of the work I've been doing with the Department of Health in the last 18 months. Um, so as you know, with, with Origin Youth Health, they're an organization that specialize in um, the kind of the more severe and complex mental health um, illnesses in young people aged 15 to 25. And they create a, or provide a very important service for those young people in Melbourne's kind of north west and west area. And basically with my PPU, part of the, the research we were looking at was the 16 bed inpatient unit, um, the psychiatric unit. And we were looking at factors that might be associated with readmission to the unit. So um, across Victoria and across um, Australia, there's a, a key performance indicator that looks at 28 day readmission 
where those young people who are discharged initially, we call that the index um, admission, and where from an unplanned point of view, they return within 28 days. Um, so listen, it was it was a really great experience to, to actually go into Origin. They've got a, a beautiful um, facility in Parkville. I, I, I'm not sure if anyone has been there, but it's really impressive, beautiful wood and a really kind of therapeutic um, environment. And that's where their head office is. Um, and basically, I spent 10 days in the office and then due to the um, pandemic um, restrictions and the, the chill directions, then I spent the second half of the PPU working from home, which was quite interesting and gave a nice little bit of balance. Um, so we ended up, um, based on, on kind of consultation with my supervisor in origin, we ended up completing a retrospective cross-sectional clinical file audit, which meant that... We, I, I basically went in as the student and accessed medical records electronically. Um, we had a specific population, so those young people who were admitted to their inpatient unit, um, who were aged 16 to 25, um, and then we looked at them over a two-year period to see who was readmitted within 28 days, and we were trying to identify if there were any specific risk factors that might be present in that group compared to a comparison group who were the same young people over a two-year period who were not admitted within 28 days. Um, so it, it, was, it was very interesting in terms of, I have a clinical background as, a, as an allied health. I'm a physiotherapy by trade, and I've worked in that role for, for about over a decade, actually. Um, and it was really interesting in, in the mental health space where there was a little bit of crossover. Um, doctors in the mental health space still have very scribbly writing, I noted, and uh, it took a while to, to basically be able to uh, find the, the key um, elements that we were looking for within large clinical files. Origin, um, over that two-year period, about halfway through, actually went completely online. So they have a, an EHR system now, which is great, but there was still a lot of scan files that we had to look at. So that, that certainly proved a little bit of a challenge. But Ultimately, in terms of our results, we found that there were no major differences between both groups that we looked at, between the readmission group and the non-readmission group, in terms of the presence of factors. Certainly, the readmission group tended to kind of stay longer, so we call that length of stay. They tended to be in the their initial admission to the inpatient unit tended to be longer, about double that of the non-readmission group. Um, and other risk factors like substance use and, and having a history of being admitted before certainly um, seemed to kind of make a bit of a difference. But uh, ultimately, there was no single factor that we found was present in the readmission group, but not in the, the non-readmission group. Um, so I guess having a kind of look at, at skills developed, and there were quite a few actually, and I, I think it's difficult to kind of bottle it all into a number, but I think... From an evaluation skills point of view, the, the PPU was a great uh, learning opportunity to, to look at um, how Origin considered their service context and their service provision. Um, you know, they deliver obviously this inpatient service, but a wide range of services um, from an outpatient point of view, a lot of outreach services. Um, so that was great to, to look at even breaking down some of the, the demographics of the clients. And that was actually quite of interest to some of their um kind of uh, exec team and, and clinical guide, governance group as well when we kind of looked at that. The other skills, I guess, that would be kind of useful and transferable were um, analytical skills that certainly I think we developed along the, the, the PPU. Um, and I think that's that's kind of built as a foundation in some of the, the subjects we do in the MPH. And, and also a kind of a, a presentation um, skills I thought was really helpful. Um, so one of the one of the benefits of doing this this uh, piece of PPU research was that uh, I got to present to the kind of clinical governance team for about fifteen to twenty minutes, and that included the director of clinical services. There was also a lead consultant psychiatrist psychiatrist there, and also um, the the nurse unit manager. And I think um, they were certainly interested in what we were kind of showing um, the results of this this audit and also the next steps, which was quite crucial in terms of whether they were going to go down the, the route of looking at a full evaluation um, to, to kind of uh, look probe a little bit deeper because we had quite a small sample size in, in the, the, the file audit. So I think there, there's a lot of um, scope to, to look at those results, and that's what's being considered right now, actually. Um, and I made a number of recommendations as part of the, the kind of PPU final report. Um, so I might kind of take a, a breath there for a moment, and, and also, uh, I guess, 
part of, of the reason I was maybe asked to contribute a little bit today is I've spent the last 18 or 19 months um, working in different roles in the Department of Health. So I went in as a, a fresh faced um, person back in March of last year. And, and certainly it's been a real roller coaster. I actually, um, before I, I was onboarded, I, I got about three phone calls asking for my date of birth. So I thought there might have been a problem with my age, but um, it just was a sign of um, how incredibly busy and, and tumultuous that time was. They were onboarding literally hundreds of new staff every day. Um, I ended up working in a kind of a, a call center team um, that were doing COVID directions. So it was called the Physical Distancing Helpline. Um, so I did that for two weeks and then I got tapped on the shoulder to take up uh, an operations manager role with the welfare check team. So that was an incredible opportunity. So the welfare check team were part of the now kind of infamous Opsateria, which was the uh, the hotel quarantine program. Um, we were working remotely. So we were based in 50 Lonsdale. And part of the work we did is we, we contacted over 30,000 international arrivals and also um, community members who would go into the hotel quarantine program and it was really interesting given my clinical background and also we worked with a variety of, of teams where referrals were needed to psychology support and mental health support and various other supports food and relief um, so I worked in that role for about eight months until our, our um, team was kind of um, stepped down as the move to justice was made for the, the entire program and then I worked in a logistics role um, so I think that was from October last year called the Community Engagement Logistics Team, so the cell team. Um, and certainly, you know, I went into that team with, with a little bit of an idea of what logistics were, but it's, it's not something we'd really cover in, a, in an MPH subject. And it was a really steep learning curve, I must say, where I became the operations lead where we were providing equipment and services and various bits of infrastructure. Um, to teams in the department like the testing team and the vaccine team. So when they needed a marquee or if they needed various items, um, then our, our, our team and I would coordinate a lot of that work. Um, so it, it was really a, a great um, opportunity for myself to develop some stakeholder management skills. We worked really closely with um, infection prevention and control teams and also with health and safety teams so that was really interesting and i guess that brings me on to to my kind of current role in the department which i guess is a little closer to where um a lot of people would think when they think about public health and, and that's an engagement and, and testing team so we're called the rapid response engagement and testing team and i know sanab and adna and a few other people who are finishing their their mphs are also on this team um, and we work really closely with um, various communities particularly high-risk communities um, like the culturally and linguistically diverse community and other high-risk groups such as um, the indigenous communities to provide a kind of a targeted testing solution so we've got 12 mobile teams who have a number of vehicles and they drive out and, and establish pop-ups and we try and bring testing solutions um, to people in the community that might be a little bit harder to reach or might find it a little bit more difficult to engage with the, the system for a number of reasons including language barriers or, or otherwise um so i might leave it at that I'm, I'm happy to take any questions and apologies again for for the lack of a screen but hopefully i've, I've done that a little bit of justice awesome thank you hugh um one question i've noted down has just popped up on the screen as well and this was from ross um just wondering if you could comment about the delivery of these services from um, this is your time at origin to culturally and linguistically diverse groups yeah absolutely and listen ross i, I think it's it's a key question you know um as part of the work we do we look at you know approximately 50 percent of those people in australia at the moment um, they either were born overseas or have one parent overseas. And I think those culturally and linguistic diverse groups initially in our pandemic response and, and you know, even in origin, they're, they're a group we, uh, we cater for carefully because when people have English as um, a second language, it makes it really difficult to, to navigate um, health systems. It makes it really difficult to access care. And 
as as challenging and uncertain as the pandemic has been for all of us i think that would be particularly so if you're trying to understand something that isn't in your your first language you know so um there, there's a huge amount of emphasis now in the department about using interpreters and using translation services and i think in origin they certainly try and um deliver culturally sensitive treatment um across different kind of mental health services and where people have a preference for for different cultural um, treatments that's often respected. Awesome, thanks, Hugh. Um, do you want to we ask the last question? Yeah. We, just a very short question, and then we'll move there because we're just short on time. But such an amazing experience that you've had. Just a keen question from uh, Fai Mei Lu: um, How do you think peer support roles or workforce could contribute to improving the twenty-eight day readmission rate? Yeah, another great question. I think it's something that Origin look at very closely. So they do have a number of peer support workers within that um, inpatient unit. Um, we didn't look at that particularly as a factor, whether they were involved in a particular client's um, outcome. But I think um, as part of a, a larger evaluation, that would one that we would definitely like to look at whether the presence of a peer support uh, workforce would, would make a difference in the, the, out, the outcome ultimately. Awesome. Thanks very much, Hugh. We could go on. I think we could keep asking questions forever, but really appreciate your time. We'll hand straight over to our last speaker, uh, Patrick Abram. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, and thank you for hosting both Sandro and Kevin. Um, it's really good to be here. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which I'm on today in Fitzroy, which is also the Wondery people of the Kulin Nation, and ex uh, extend that respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm not going to use the slideshow either just in case there's any any difficulties uh, today, but I'm also here to, to speak about my PPU experience. Um, so I did the, the MPH from 2018 and 2019, so finishing two years ago, uh, which included a, a PPU placement um, in the last just one final semester for, for about five months um, of, of 2019. Um, and I started off my my mph journey solely focused on on going into global health and stumbled into health economics in my second semester of, of first year and and really then changed changed the direction of where i wanted to take my my public health journey really into a into a health economics um background but i guess because of that uncertainty and chopping between specializations a, a research project didn't really seem fitting and i wanted to get some some experience um in an industry setting instead uh, so I did my uh, placement at a place called the Global Health Alliance Australia, which has recently changed now uh, names, sorry, and it's now called the Australian Global Health Alliance. Um, and my project was on a type of healthcare financing um, system in low and middle income settings, which is uh, primarily in low and middle income settings, which is called impact investing. Uh, so the Global Health Alliance is a member based organization, um, which means a lot of its projects are driven from the demands of, of those member organizations. So there was a lot of um, requests in the NGO space for um, for impact investing knowledge and insights. So it was it was something that the, the members brought to the organization. Um, and then I came on board to, to run the project and essentially gather as much information in, in the space of impact investing as we could to then deliver a report to our members and, and host a workshop on impact investing. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it was a, a while ago, it's, it's going on two years now, so I feel like it, um, and my career since then has gone into to quite a different direction. But um, yeah, the, the, the project itself was, was really valuable in, in going out in industry and, and learning to network. And, and you know, we, we had all kinds of different stakeholders from, from different members of, of international non-government organizations to people from Department um, of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, to, to direct funders and, and, and medical organizations. So to, to get such exposure into, I guess, so many different um, types of stakeholders in, in healthcare financing was a really, um, a really useful um, experience for me to, to have such hands-on um, experience. Um, and then we we delivered a session as well at the um, Australian Council for International Development's annual conference uh, up in Sydney at the end of 2019. So it was a, a good opportunity for then me to present all of my findings and, and facilitate a workshop with with people in the industry on 
on a, a new and alternative way of, of healthcare financing. Um, so yeah, I think it was a, it was a really useful um, way to end end my MPH and kind of putting a lot of the skills that I learned um, both around global health and around health economics into into practice in what what was useful for um, useful for for the industry. And so that concluded in 2019. And um, as we all remember, <laughs> January 2020 came with some some huge changes from there. Um, and I found some employment and it was through a connection that I made at the PPU uh, back within the, the school. So I, I now work for the health economics unit. Um, and I started working one week before we were all <laughs> the first national lockdown and we we're all sent home. So I got about one week of, of office experience and then yeah, quickly, quickly transitioning into the, the work from home life that I guess we all know so well now as well. Um, but one of the, the exciting things was in the first, uh, I think it was the first month or so of, of me being employed, I was also recruited into Tony Blakely's team in the population interventions unit, as well as being in the health economics unit, um, which was, you know, a really incredible um uh, I guess uh, something that I'd never really considered and as, as was spoken about before epidemiology was never no one really knew what that word meant and then all of a sudden my boss is on tv every night and I've got meetings with him in the hour before and the, the hour afterwards and and it's kind of work that I'm contributing to that's being presented on the project each night or, or, or whichever sunrise each morning um which was uh, you know it was it was a, a big learning curve really and I know that um you know it was spoken about before about the, the changing perception of epidemiology. And I think that has definitely been a, a blessing and a curse, um, you know, given how much the, you know, lockdowns impacted everyone. And, and we were a team that were involved in the modelling that supported that meant that we were met with a lot of criticism as well as as a lot of, I guess, the fame and infamy come, come hand in hand um, with these types of things. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, it was... Um, yeah, it's really been a learning curve for, I think, a lot of us in public health that kind of have worked not so much in the limelight to all of a sudden be thrown in a space where your work is so highly scrutinised by the public, um, but also like recognised by the public as well. And I know that public health up until the pandemic really had a um, perception of being a, quite slow moving and it takes a long time to get policy into practice. And then all of a sudden public health practitioners and, and, and public health academics are the decision makers that are sending you know, 26 million people into lockdown. So um, it did, it did be, um, w was quite a, quite an adjustment period. Um, and I think one of the things that you know, were talking, talking about technology, but one of the things that uh, I think Tony did really well in, in trying to change, I guess, some sort of for, form of public opinion on us is making all of our modeling publicly available. So creating web tools where the public and decision makers and the Department of Health, both in Victoria and Australia can log on online and, and use the models that we've created ourselves that kind of puts the onus and, and on on those people instead of it falling back on us saying that we we made that decision to to open your work up in, a, in an online platform is something that probably would never have been considered two years ago and, and that's really really come a long way um so yeah i guess that's that's been my journey over the last two years or two and a half years in, at the end of the mph and then and now beyond um, and in the future, I guess I'm, I'm looking to start my PhD at the beginning of next year. So we'll see how that goes. I, I know I've transitioned out of, they say, take the PPU if you want to go into industry and I've fallen straight back into research and then pushing towards a PhD. So I might be a, a bit of an anomaly for PPU students. Um, but yeah, that's, that's been my journey. And I, I found the PPU actually a really, really incredible experience, um, in, in so many ways and, and yeah, would, would definitely recommend it as well to, to those considering it in, in the coming year or so within the MPH. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Can I ask you a question about, I mean, obviously a huge amount of change that you had to um, navigate and you, you, you're going into lockdown, you're exploring a new area that you never thought would be kind of your passion. You're finding these new passions. Um, you're thrown into a pandemic. How, how did you look after yourself um, and, and what kind of reflections do you have for maybe students thinking about kind of trying something different in, in, in how they how they do that in a way that also looks after their own personal um, mental and physical health in the process. 
a, a great question. Um, and it's something that I don't know that I did all too too particularly well, especially at the beginning when it was like I, I found that <laughs> I found that I, I threw myself into work far more than I probably would have liked to. That it was like a coping mechanism of lockdown was like, well, if I'm at home bored, I may as well be be at home working. Um, which is definitely not what I would recommend to other people, I think. But also, it, I guess what made that easier was when the work you're doing has such um, real life implications, and it's so it's such a quickly changing space, and 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 rapidly turns into policy. Um, it, it kind of made that made that easier. But I also have a we have a really really supportive team at the health economics unit, and they're they're very um, all of the the senior research fellows and, and and professors within the unit really do kind of make sure that you're not doing too much or that if you are doing too much they'll be scheduling your, your RDOs to make sure that, that, that your overtime is recognized <laughs> um, so I think yeah having having a really supportive work environment when we all were working from home was also just yeah could couldn't have been more valuable I guess awesome yeah what do they say we're we're, we're not working from home we're living at work so exactly. um, <laughs> have we got any questions uh, for Patrick? I don't know, maybe Kevin, do you have a, do you have a question or to ask? I did. I did have a question. And probably if you had, I was just thinking if you'd done your um, PPU during COVID, you might have had a different experience, I suppose, because you finished just before. I was wondering about money. Do you, how hard are these um, healthcare financing investors, how hard are they to come by? And do you think that's changed since the pandemic? Would it be oh, yeah. easier to find investors now, now that we all know what you know? The health financing space, yeah. yeah. How's COVID affected that? Great question. Yeah, and I think it is a, a, another great question, really, and it's probably something that's really context-specific on, on where it is. Something that we definitely have noticed is that priorities, obviously, and, and, and as they should have, shifted to COVID, but which meant that a lot of other disease areas get neglected in terms of both government and, and financing um, of different areas. And a lot of projects that we were working on kind of got, got paused and and almost forgotten about and only kickstarting now two years later but for, for a lot of these things the, the health issues are still there and if not they have been made worse from COVID so um, yeah but I, but I also think that the pandemic has kind of shone that light on on economics as well and it's it's kind of showed that the, the compatibility of economics and financing and, and how that does play into epidemiology and, and I mean in particular in this case infectious diseases but but all kinds of diseases as well so yeah, I guess the the health financing space is is a really complicated one, and it's so um, so driven by the context that it's in. So, yeah, I'm not really sure if that was a good answer to that question or not. Sorry. No, it's a great answer. Thank you. I are we bringing back the other speakers as well? Are we? Is that possible? I don't know if that was the plan from the organisers, but otherwise, if if uh, oh here here here's Hugh. Um, so, if we have any questions now, we've got a couple of minutes. We've got four minutes left. Uh, Hugh is back. Yeah, you've got lots of questions, Sophie. Uh, Hugh is back, and I think Sander might be joining us in a moment. But um, did you have any questions for either each each other? Otherwise, we'll lunge back into our own questions. But um... yeah, I guess um, you go. You go. Yeah, whilst we're waiting, I had one question for Hugh, and it was around I think the role that cultural intervention plays in um, in um, in reducing that 28 day readmission um, that we're talking about it, was there was there a talk or at least um space um do you do you think for cultural intervention for young people yeah thanks kevin it, it's it's something that um we try to look at but it isn't always very well documented in a young person's medical record um, we struggled even at times to find the country of birth for example of the parents because we did try and look at that and from a cultural point of view someone might speak english they might be born in australia but that doesn't always mean that they identify as just australian they they might have um, parents from south sudan for example and and um, identify with that cultural group so we we probably need to do a better job um when we admit people at capturing that data if people are happy to to kind of um share it with us because i think it will help inform some of those groups that uh maybe we could try and target that that treatment a little bit more culturally specific to yeah and i might i might have missed this when you mentioned it but did you mention covid as a factor when you were when you're going through your factors of the 28 day readmission i know you had mentioned obviously um alcohol and drugs etc was covid a factor do you find 
it, it was really difficult to, to determine that because um, the pandemic kind of kicked in about halfway through the, the two year period. So when we were trying to look at kind of files, we weren't actually looking at kind of when along that two years they were um, they were admitted. But one thing we did notice is that the demand for beds within the 16 bed unit certainly increased in that pandemic period the the level of mental health distress and um, accessibility actually became even more difficult than normal awesome we've got one final question um from zoe nakakis really great question so what advice do you have for students who want to do a ppu um and uh hugh might start with you and patrick will come to you in a second just one or two high level pieces nuggets of gold uh good, good question zoe i i think for myself being a, a practical person i often learn by doing and i think um oh. as kind of patrick mentioned i think having that ability to to go into a workplace uh work alongside colleagues and see um try and kind of implement some of the learnings into like a, a practical uh skill is, is something i value really high so so that would definitely be one reason to consider it and for myself i, I don't plan on going into research so the, the ppu gave me a great opportunity to to do a little bit of an audit like this but also get that industry experience awesome thank you um and uh, patrick um yeah i would say I mean, Sue, Sue Durham, who's the, the coordinator for PPU, is is so good at her job. And and if you are looking to do a PPU, that really specifying to her what you want to get out of it and what kind of organisations you are interested in um, is, is really good. The other thing that I would say is that we had quite a close group of people who were also doing the PPU. So it was really handy to, to keep really in contact with the, your peers that were doing, you know, completely different projects, but essentially the similar experience as well to kind of bounce off and, and, and see what their experience was like in comparison to yours and whether you were getting as much out of it as they were or getting more. I thought that was a really, a really helpful thing for, for my PPU time as well. Awesome. And we do, we do have one more question. I know we're about out of time, but uh, Hugh, this is a question I hear all the time. I'd love you to answer it. Um, as a physiotherapist, can you combine clinical work and public health work? Uh, is, it, uh, is it one or the other, or do you think you'll find ways of combining work clinically with uh, your, your MPH? Yeah, li listen, I, I love that question. And it's it's certainly something that I've, I've kept. Um, you, you have to be registered in Australia. It's called APRA, as some of you might know. So I've kept my registration up. And I certainly do get a couple of calls and texts from time to time to see someone who's put out their shoulder as a dodgy knee. Um, and, and that one-on-one -on -one interaction, you know, I, I really enjoy. So I think um, the, the pandemic and, and a role in a COVID response role has been really difficult to do both. But, but it, if there are any opportunities in the future to, to find a little bit of balance and maybe even one day a week still tip my hand in a clinical aspect, I'll, I'll certainly consider it. Awesome. And um, there's, there's, I keep saying one more, but um, <laughs> Patrick, there's a question there from Gabriel. Uh, how do you manage your PPU and studies simultaneously? Uh, yeah, a great question. I think setting quite clear boundaries from the beginning of your PPU on, on what days that you're there and what days you are working and, and when you are available for them and, and trying to keep to that so you're not bringing too much kind of workload into into your life so you can still keep doing um, your studies. And again, also just really focusing on what, what assessment tasks you have due in and, and getting as much done as early as you can so that you don't get to week 11 and 12 and your PPU is getting to its final crunch time and so are all your assessments at the same time. So getting on top of it, your assessments in particular really early, I think is probably the best advice I could give. Awesome. Thanks guys, that was uh, amazing. And thank you to Sander who um, I'm sure is uh, wasn't able to join us at the end, but thank you for her time as well. Um, we will hand back to uh, the organizers and thanks for having us. Thanks Sandra, thanks, thanks for having you. Thanks for your time, Sandra and Kevin, and your impeccable hosting skills. Uh, thanks to the students as well, Sonda, Hugh, and Patrick. Um, we'll be in touch with you uh, to give you some gifts for your participation. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Coco, who will introduce the next section of the conference. Hi everyone, my name is Coco. I'm a committee member here from the MPJHSS. Um, so now let me um, introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Mawofa. Uh, Dr. Mawofa Said Jose is a PhD, is a researcher, innovator, a social entrepreneur, teacher, and author of 
health informatics in the Arab world affiliated with Hamad Bin Khalifa University, College of Science and Engineering, Qatar Foundation, Qatar. His primary research interests are around the use of information and the communication technologies to empower patients and clinicians. Specific, specifically, focusing on social media and the mobile technologies in healthcare in the promotion of public health practice and healthcare literacy. Now we are going to hand over to his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor for me to join you, although not physically, not online, synchronously, asynchronously, uh, here from uh, Qatar, uh, from the Middle East. Today, I'll talk to you about uh, public health informatics and artificial intelligence. Is it just a brush of fresh air or just another coat of paint? And I'm really excited uh, to be part of this conference and I want to extend uh, my thanks to the organizers that uh, reached out to me and asked me to present. So it's an honor and a privilege and I wish you all the best throughout the remaining components and parts of the conference. I'm an associate professor here at the College of Science and Engineering at Hamad bin Khalifa University. We're part of the Qatar Foundation. Uh, we have two programs here in digital health, one in information systems and one focusing on AI data analytics. I'm also an adjunct associate professor in the School of Health Information Science at the University of Victoria not the University of Victoria in Australia. For some reason, someone, anyway, <laughs> but the University of Victoria in, in Canada. I just wanna start uh, something very basic. And, and if you look at the you know, counting marbles, let's count marbles together. And as you can see is naturally we love to count, we love to quantify. And you can see, you know, I can count one, two, three, four, five, okay, then it gets a little bit harder after six, you know, seven, eight. And, and why do you think that? So why would you think that it gets harder as more um, information is being presented to us? Because these marbles is the information. And basically the oldest form of counting is, is our hands. And naturally, you know, we count to five and we count to 10, it's pretty easy. But when things get harder, when we are we have too much information and we need methods to quantify or tools to quantify and there's a limitation to our beautiful yet limited human ba brain in how we process this information and types of information as well we can probably count but how many we can tell the different colors shapes how relationships between the different marbles is very very difficult and that's why we need to quantify uh, information. And you know, the oldest tools that I've uh, that they say is a is a bone bone from thirty five thousand BC, and it was used as an artifact to it's a bone uh, to count lunar days and the menstrual cycle. And the thing is that they're mentioning when I was reading that this is the you know the first mathematicians were women, so. This is a great, uh, a great thing uh, to know. Uh, I have three daughters, so uh, something to encourage encourage them maybe to pursue math mathematics. I just want to talk. Uh, I'll get into public health and informatics. And um, public health, as you might know, is defined as a systematic application of information, computer science, technology, and areas of public health, including surveillance prevention, preparedness, and health promotion. And if you look at this image uh, figure that I have, and we look at informatics, and this is probably one of the uh, 
most high level abstract representation of the field itself. And you can see that I've highlighted the public health informatics. And if you can see the link between clinical informatics and public health informatics, uh, we won't talk about population health informatics. We have a lot of discussions about, you know, the difference in population health informatics and public health, but you know, it's becoming less, the, the boundaries are less clear, but in general, we look at public health uh, uh, informatics, it relies a lot on the clinical data and the clinical information that is being used because the clinical information looks at the individual. And in order to look at groups, you need to have that data at the clinical level to be able to aggregate it, to understand it. And you look at that from a public health uh, level, you know, uh, surveillance systems or, or registries those kind of systems are, are used, uh, especially you know, during the pandemic of COVID. Public health informatics was a, played a key role in understanding the spread of disease during this time. And when we look at public health informatics, uh, we look, you know, the pre-computer area uh, where people, you know, using uh, literally you know, formulas and paper to collect information. And then, you know, with the uh, personal computing and client server technology in the 70s and 80s and the 90s we have the web service and cloud computing and then and until today and now you know the rise of artificial intelligence and I have some insights into that that will help you uh, in the future and to think about public health informatics and the role that AI plays because I really feel that um, the role of artificial intelligence will play much bigger and more importantly in public health than any anything else. I love this story and I, I, even though, and the reason that this is important because although we're talking about technology and public health, we must remember that when we talk about informatics in general, public health informatics, technology and information is what 90% of people focus on, but they don't focus on people. What do I mean by that? This this is one of the you won't find this paper uh, in the lit, in the in schools or textbooks. I uh, you know luckily found this paper, and it's from 1951, and it's in the BMJ. It was a uh, Playfair. He was a physician, and basically what he did, he took a record keeping system. That's the system of record keeping. You know the filing systems at the time. There were no computers at the time that people had access to, but it was a record keeping system in general practice. He was a family practitioner. Uh, uh, he would go to the hospitals, visit his patients or from his clinic. And what he wanted to do, he wanted to kind of collect the information in a way that he can understand his patients better. And what happened was he created these cards. His cards had information. And he created like a, actually a workflow that you can see on the right. Um, you can see on the right, you can see the, the, the workflow that, um, uh, that he created. And based on that workflow and the card, he would visit his patients, collect information, and it made it very accessible for him to get that information every time and to know what happened before with his patients. But look at the comment at the end. And this is what I love about uh, about this paper. He says something that's very interesting. And I'm going to use a, a, a pen here. And he says the system is based on accepted business filing methods. The filing index, the hinges, and the uh, and the tags are standard from the Shannon systems, right? And this is all a this is a record keeping system. There's nothing. There's no computers or nothing. So think of this as a computer at the time. So the routine hasn't been used for three years and served very well. Those are my colleagues who see it. This is very, see it, my colleagues, meaning other physicians who see it for the first time, think it cumbersome. This is because they're looking at a new method with a new apparatus before they understand or have worked it. However, locum tenants and medical, these are residents, have very quickly grasped it and have welcomed its speed and simplicity. Imagine that we're talking about a paper method system. Speed and simplicity takes very little space, requires no structural rearrangement. The drawer cabinet along the side, the consulting room desk, 
and the current file on the table are easily handled. The advantage of having the patient's records with one at times of visiting needs needs no stressing. And this is interesting, talking about admin. However, expenses however, do require comment. The initial outlay of the files is moderate. 1,000 cards printed to my design costs about, I don't know what that value is today. Thus, each card represents around a certain value, which I don't know what it represents these days. But some may doubt whether the cost is justified, but I continue to find it a most worthwhile expenditure. And this is so typical <clears throat> when you're introducing any new technology. This story from 1951 and this story of today are the same. But new technologies, you know, doctors or public health, oh, there's new technology, oh, we don't want to use it, we like the way that we're doing. New residents that are used to this technology, you know, phones or tablets, yeah, yeah this is really cool. Uh, uh, and then, you know, administrators don't like it because they have to pay for it. And this is a typical, uh, a very typical. So why is this important? Because when you're working with the public health, we're talking about technology, always remember that technology is only a tool that should help you do your job easier and uh, easier, faster, and it should give you more autonomy. And unfortunately, systems, especially electronic health record, is making our, our jobs more difficult with the information that we have and is not giving us the autonomy that we need. So we really need, need to focus on the people components. Now I'm going to move into, that's very important, that even though I'm talking about technology and AI and all that cool, really cool, interesting stuff, we need to focus on people as well. And today, look at, you know, ask yourself in the audience, you know, there's how many have their smart watches or, you know, tracking uh, their oxygen or their number of steps or heartbeats and this patient generated health data. Patients are generated health, their own health data. And imagine that. Imagine public health systems are not looking, they're overwhelmed with data from the clinical side. Now they have patients are generating their own data. They're getting data from multiple different sources. And how do we make sense out of that? And we're moving away from the electronic health records to more wearables, to more gen patient generated health data. And there's so much information being shared and, and being stored, yet as public health professionals, are we using them? Are we making sense out of them? You know, I showed you the marbles. There's almost so much the human brain can understand when we collect information, we're very limited. And that's why we need these systems. And these systems are very important. We come to analyze this massive data of information, to visualize it for us so we can actually make sense out of it, and then make interventions within the community on any public, with any public health domain, that we are and develop policies around that. And that's very, very crucial. And we need methods and ways of doing that. Look at this. Every time I see this, and it gives me, I get overwhelmed with anxiety. Look at the information that we're collecting. How do we make sense of this data for public health? We're collecting structured, unstructured data from blogs, tweets, credit card, labs, clinical data, administrative related data, uh, data that are that people are collecting on uh, uh, online, data that people are requesting like their DNA. And then we're talking about precision medicine and then we're talking about personalized healthcare. We're talking about all these different types of new ways that we're trying to use data to integrate it. And, and hopefully that we can improve people's quality of their life, which we forget that. And always remember the people, the people, I don't mean just the patients, the clinicians, the public health professionals, the nurses, everyone working within the field. We need to think about them. We need to, and when you see this information every time, it's just, wow, I just feel overwhelmed. This is, there's lots of information here that's missing because this is a few years old. And there's lots of information that's missing and people that are actually collecting this information. And when we talked about public health or informatics research as an informatician, how do we take this data that we have that's unraw interpreted from these multiple data sources that we have, right? Because even in healthcare, even public health, 80% or 9% of the information that we use is generated from the clinical health, the, the, the electronic health record, the medical record. But now patients are collecting more information, you know, and we don't know how to process and what to do with that. It's very hard to, we need to integrate that in 
workflows and, and, and so forth. And how do we take that information? Not just, not just only create uh, uh, scorecards, standards, how do we create policies that make a difference? And we go back into the community and actually, and monitor that over time. And I really believe the future uh, for public health and public health informatics revolves on not how do we collect the data or the information that we provide, it's that moving from that, okay, now we have wisdom and knowledge, we understand our communities and what's happening, but how do we go back and develop policies and monitor them and evaluate them to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for our communities? And we need to look and, uh, uh, also at other things like the social determinants of health on education, uh, neighborhood, environment, uh, health and digital le literacy and mental health, which is an area I'll talk about and I'll focus on. That. And one of my uh, missions is really, you know, uh, to research the application of responsible and innovative and financially sustainable artificial intelligence solutions that personalize health education and empower vulnerable individuals and communities within Qatar, the mini region, uh, the Middle East region, North Africa region, and around the world. This is my passion. And, you know, uh, when I talk about financially sustainable, a lot of the work that we do, I want it to continue. So, you know, we need to be, as public health professionals or practitioners, we need to think of this concept of, of social entrepreneurship, that we're doing uh, good in society by doing well financially. I'm not a businessman. I just want to keep my ideas going and make them financially uh, stable, uh, sustainable. It's about sustainability of our ideas, because a lot of our ideas, if we don't, you know, they're great, we get funding, then after that, they're not financially sustainable, then we can't leave them. I'll talk about my current uh, area of mental health informatics, and and this has, you know, become a public health issue, especially uh, uh, during um, uh, COVID, uh, which we've seen the rise and more people talk about it. And the major challenge of public health has been the focus on, you know, mostly public health on disease prevention or surveillance has been focused a lot on the physical health. But there has been a more recent public health focus on the emotional, mental health and well-being and the so other social determinants of health as well. Imagine that, that people that developed COVID, and I have a colleague that developed COVID and he was almost going to pass away and he's never been the same. He's never been the same the impact and the toll that it had on his mental health, I can't even explain. So we, we need to, especially in the you know, post-pandemic world, um, you know, things have changed and things are different. And we need to look at mental health. And it really has become a public health issue. One in five COVID patients about mental illness within 90 days. And even though that we, you know, you know the entire one in seven in the, in the world you know, have one or more mental or substance abuse. This is insane if you think about that. How could not how could it not be a public health issue? Or a, or a global public health issue? And we're talking about depression, anxiety, bipolar, eating disorders, schizophrenia, and, and these problems, the amount of impact they have, not just on you and just they're disabling at times. They're disabling and they can impact your life, impact the way you communicate with others, impact your employment. There are so many repercussions when we keep things inside and we don't reach out for help that mental health can be uh, not, not a good thing, especially if, if it's an issue. And we look at, you know, there was a report here by the Wish Foundation. It's part, part of my, the Qatar Foundation, where we work, and they came up with a report in 2020 about the digital mental health revolution. And you know, they talk about, you know, you know, people with a mental health disorder, after going through treatment, only 0.5 will fully, fully benefit out of 10. And this is, you know, it's hard to understand or to know why, but as public health professionals in doing informatics, understanding why we need to understand why so we can do the proper interventions. And if, you know, I like to bring the context of the Middle East and this part of the region, and people don't know this, that we have a history, culturally, religiously, on uh, the area of mental health and to keep, uh, 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 be positive or be happy or be peaceful. Um, you know, it's part of the uh, cultural religious ethos of being a Muslim, uh, of being a pious person. 
and this, you know, inspired many uh, traditional uh, uh, scholars in the Muslim world to look at, uh, you know, psychology and psychiatry. And Razi is a famous um, uh, physician, philosopher, uh, over a thousand years ago. He, you know, he had a book on traditional psychology. And he says, you know, I love this quote, and this quote can be used today or anytime. The doctor's aims to do good, even to our enemies, so much more to our friends, and my profession forbids us to do harm to our kindred, as it is instituted for the benefit and welfare of the human race, and God imposed on the, uh, on the physicians the oath not to compose fear. fear and I, you know, in a secular world and so forth, uh, you know, the, the concept of God is not there, but... In our part of the world, the concept of God is crucial. It's part of us. It's every even if you're not religious, you use God. You invoke God's help, and all the time, it's you know, uh, it's a you have to understand that is a very important part of our culture. But at the same time, if you look at what's happening in in this part of the world when it comes to mental health, you know, in Syria or Yemen or in different countries, there's really in Palestine, in Gaza. Uh, which you know, my ethnically, my parents are from, and you know, there are very serious uh, repercussions of war and economic, uh, uh, you know, related to economics and war and other social political issues that are really causing a lot of stress on population. But yet, there's not a lot of investment in psychiatry or in psychology to provide the help because people are trying to live a life. People want to eat, you know, and then they can worry about their mental health, and that's very sad. It's very sad what's happening. Look at Syria, what's happening. It's only in the whole country, 70 qualified psychiatrists. And, and, and the, the trauma that the people have lived there is unbelievable, unbelievable. I have a friend that works a lot in, in this area. And the, the stories that, that, that you hear are just horrifying. And if you look at the, you know, the Arab world in general, there was a, a report by Al Jazeera that the three saddest places in the world that have been in the Arab, uh, uh, with Iraq, Lebanon, and Tunisia, the most sad and anxious people in the world. So the top 10. And when we talk about culture and religion, in our religion culture, from our Islamic tradition, from our prophetic tradition, we learn about lots in the Quran and the, and the authentic hadith, the narrations of the prophet. You know what I mean? Ways to uh, 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 remove depression. Uh, through prayer, through remembering God, certain uh, prayers that help, and they do help. And we actually did a, a systematic review meta-analysis. We weren't able to publish it because no one, <laughs> it's very hard to publish that type of work. But we looked at uh, the role of, of this uh, uh, type of tradition, uh, remembering God on depression, anxiety, and it actually shows that there's positive results on that, even though there's more work positive, but we haven't been able to publish the, this work. And talk about this culture of context. Now, I live, you know, I, I've been to Australia once, uh, sent you to the University of Melbourne uh, for a job there, uh, the computer science department. So I've been there. It's a beautiful country. Um, and you always need to think of how can we not just borrow other things from other countries, how can we contextualize and make it our own? In Zimbabwe, they, the country has only 10 psychiatrists. And uh, what they did is they, they, well, they said they put a bench in different places and then you at this friendship bench and you come and, and sit down and a, a grandmother will sit there and listen to you and em give you empathy and give you the time that you need and this has been a very very successful program even though they didn't have the psychiatrist they had people that come in and i imagine that even though if you don't have um people that are trained you can have people that can do the work and i imagine when we talk about technology and artificial intelligence and that kind of. I'm going to move because uh, I can talk and uh, uh, for a long time. I'm very passionate about this. And Qatar, you're one of the few places in the Middle East uh, that has a national mental health strategy because mental health um, here, in terms of um, uh, the impact that it has on the population, is is very high. It's one of one of the highest in the world, and that's why Qatar developed this mental health strategy. And they're very very serious about this. Even at our work during COVID, uh, you know, we were provided with psychological uh, help, support, and, and so forth. So mental health is being more recognized and accepted. Uh, that is an issue and that we need to deal with it. Um, 
and we've talked about you know digital mental health there's a lot of tools in, in terms of apps peer-to-peer -peer, digital therapeutics telehealth there's a lot of apps that we do but one of the main issues or struggles in this particular field is that yeah a lot of apps have been developed but not only been evaluated in such a long time that we can actually see the impact or efficacy or effectiveness of these apps over time in a real uh, manner i want to just briefly talk more on the technology now we we talked you know about uh, all the different types of data, uh, why it's important for public health, that we need to focus on people, is it very, even though it doesn't matter, the, uh, on that we need to understand context in terms of what's happening, you know, in terms of religion or culture. And I'll talk about, I wanna go about AI, just a little focus on that. And this was a really uh, interesting study. It was recently done in last year, looked at machine learning, deep learning studies on PubMed, and I'm sure you're familiar with PubMed, and if you do a search, but if you look at um, a lot of the uh, work that's been done, it's been increasing exponentially over the last few years, if you can see with this particular graph right here. Uh, um, and there's been a focus on pathology, path, uh, uh, radiology, and, and, and surgery. And radiology has probably been one of, you know, the, probably the most revolutionary place, that's at, especially with deep learning and image computing, that's been uh, occurring um, um, I'm talking about diagnostic radiology, not intervention. And then uh, psychiatry is a very, very good at looking at mental health. And we talk about artificial, just to give you, you know, artificial narrow intelligence, that's where we are today. So AI, you know, is focused on, you know, surgery, pathology, but there's no one AI that looks at everything. And so we're, very, we're in an era of artificial narrow intelligence. And we're moving more towards this artificial general intelligence and meaning if you have a chat bot, uh, I don't know if you Babylon or add other two apps that you can, you know, have some of the chat and it'll help you diagnose, but it's very general. And uh, with artificial general terms, you're trying to be as good or as smart as humans, all right, where we can, uh, we can communicate with it and, and it's almost human-like and it can ask almost any question. Now, artificial super intelligence, I'll give you a quick story. Imagine now we're at a party, we're after the conference, everyone's enjoying their time and we're having a lot of fun, everyone's talking. And all of a sudden, when there's a fly in the room, and would that fly know there's 50 people, everyone's eating, talking, would it know what's happening in the room? Will it understand what people are talking about? Will it know what's happening? Probably not. When we talk about artificial superintelligence, we will be the fly. We won't even know what's happening, uh, what, how they're making decisions. And that's happening with deep neural networks and how these neural networks are deep learning, how they come up with their decisions, it's a black box. And, it, and that's just going to get, and you know, becoming over reliant on this black box, and it's hard for us to understand it. And with artificial super intelligence, we, we even, <laughs> I think, we'll be lost. We need to, we almost need to become what I say uh, here, cyborgs. And this is what uh, Elon Musk is doing: is, is we're actually in order to compete and understand, not just to be the fly, to be, uh, we need to almost be somewhat cyborg-like uh, in order to compete or order to understand what's happening with these supercomputers. And this is really what's happening uh, um, now with uh, uh, you know, embedded chips in people's minds and eyes and this stuff is happening and it's, and it's real. I just wanna give you about a very quick story about AI. Doctors don't uh, uh, sometimes like this or people, you know, and this is now, it's challenging. Now, if you've been to London, you know the black cabs. Now the black cab is one of the hardest exams you can do in the world takes years. It's more difficult than any uh, uh, medical exam for or licensing or anything like that. It's a very difficult. You have to remember, years, you have to remember 25,000 streets, businesses, landmarks. And it's just a very difficult, very, very difficult exam. One of the most difficult in the world. And all of a sudden, you're studying all these years and you memorize and you're still learning all the time. And an, an app like Uber comes along that puts everything that you know, all your knowledge, makes the values, everything that you have done, makes you almost invaluable, no value. And how will this impact clinical professionals? <clears throat> so with AI, the argument people say is that AI will replace doctors versus doctors uh, uh, not using AI will be replaced. So basically the argument is will AI re re uh, replace doctors? And uh, the, no, it won't replace, but doctors not using AI will be replaced. 
my argument is if we can have that uber example do we need 10 years of medical school to learn about how dif differential diagnosis when an algorithm can do this better and with with less errors if it's done properly and in time and evaluated you know there's over a hundred thousand people that die or more in the states with good medical errors so what's going to happen i believe i don't think you need that you're going to have something maybe like a digital healthcare pro professional someone in those two years understands um algorithms is somebody that's more empathetic that understands the system and can help people and can prescribe apps to them can help them navigate if they need to see a doctor professional they need to but it's i i really don't believe that you need 10 years to do that there's and, and by the way there's something that's even more fast there's unassisted robotic surgery unassisted robots doing surgery on their own it, it, it's insane what's happening with ai right now um Barriers to entry, I think, into medicine will be reduced um, because of AI. Base patients will benefit because now they can, if the AI is good, they'll get information. Or you can try the Babylon Edo, which is that. I will dilute the value of the medical workforce. I strongly believe that. It will dilute it. Um, so patients will actually be empowered. They'll have information and they can make decisions. And that role between clinical and non clinician will start to blur. And that's very scary, uh, but very good if done properly. Uh, is there a bright spot for public health professionals? And you know, it's funny, um, not funny, but sad or whatever, but AI today, um, it's used a lot by governments for surveillance. It's probably one of the best applications of AI, whatever you, you know, to monitor populations. People don't like that, especially in Western countries anywhere, but it's surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. It's been key probably the most no one can deny the impact of surveillance and collecting information and monitoring populations has been huge when it comes to ai the biggest more than any therapeutics treatment or diagnostics surveillance has been key all right and that brings a lot of ethical and other questions in terms of surveillance and how deep do we want people to know about us but i believe when it comes to public health professionals i really believe that you have a bigger role than actually more than physicians in collecting this information, understanding it, and creating policies around that. So public health professionals and AI will have, I think, the biggest role, and population health experts as well, uh, the biggest role in AI, and probably the most, I, I actually believe there's more value to public health professionals and less value to clinical professionals, uh, medical professionals working in the field. So I believe public health professionals and AI will help you because Today, it's the information, that information that you have and the algorithms that create to understand it and to know what's going on in the population, going back into the population and making intervention, understanding and making targeted interventions will be huge for public health professionals. I believe that. I believe that and because surveillance is huge. I think it'll be uh, a big area. I'm going to move into um, uh, in the projects that we're working on. There's three projects that I'll talk about related to uh, mental health we're trying to develop so uh, 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 a personalized and talented mental health platform for other near world we're trying to it's nothing new uh, but we're trying to do a chat bot uh, uh, for mental health because uh, you know people don't like the stigma of mental health is huge the social economic repercussions of mental health is, is, is huge on uh, um, this part of the world right um, God forbid, uh, you know, oh, someone knows that my daughter has a serious mental health uh, health issue. It could be ADHD, depression, for example, in terms of her chance of, of marry, marriage or other kind of jobs. And it might impact impact the way uh, that you look on my side. There's a lot of stigma around that. It's changing, especially post-COVID, because a lot of people you know, are talking about this and is more open about it. But we need to provide information to people and uh, in order that they can make, um, uh, this is the team that we're working with. We also have Seven Cups, who's a partner in, in this work. So it's an AI-driven chatbot. It looks at we using evidence in terms of providing information. It'll be in Arabic. It'll try to understand uh, the per, how the person is interacting with the, the app and trying to give them personalized information. Uh, we're looking at you know this input, these processes that we want to connect, inform, and empower. And our output, and hopefully, is um, you know, uh, we have something for patients, poly and the healthcare system. We want to be hopefully a referral server, hopefully that people have information that they feel okay to go see a doctor. We want to create, give 
people that it's okay to go see a doctor. Give them that, you know, you should go see a doctor. Access people, a lot of people don't and don't like don't like doing it. Um, I'll move on to, we published a few reviews in, in, in order to learn. Now, this has probably been uh, uh, about mental health promotion through art, probably been one of the most successful projects that I've worked on. We won the United Nations uh, AI for Development Challenge. Um, it was a 5,000. We just got the money today, actually, after months, which is great. We split it between the teams, about $5,000, but it was the United Nations Innovate, uh, Challenge. And we, in all of uh, Middle East and Africa, we got number one in, the, in this part of the region for it, so which was, which was awesome. And basically, um, it's a very simple uh, concept. Uh, basically, we try to use art to understand the emotions of children. We try, uh, uh, we try to build emotion literacy and encourage bonding between the parent and child through the art that they create, through a tool, an app that we developed that uses AI to help encourage that emotion literacy and bonding between parent and child. And what we're trying to do is bring the families together, connect the families through art. Basically, you collect the memories, you collect the emotions, and you we encourage a family bonding through a number of different questions uh, um, as well. I'll just kind of go through the, um, uh, uh, the app. It's very, very simple. You, that you can download it. I'll show you a, a QR code and we'd be, we'd be honored to get your uh, positive reviews on it. It'll help us. But uh, you can you add a drawing, you know, the child draws, you create a profile for them, they add, you select the child that you want to upload with a picture and it gives you uh, a result and the great thing about this it gives you so it links with each image you link in emotion a certain number of questions that we're going to ask right and positive or negative emotions that the algorithm will give you and then you can actually uh, uh, look at that over time and we worked with an art therapist we had about a thousand images that we collected online that she categorized them into positive and negative because going to other labels of it's a little bit more complicated to add more, more, what we're trying to do that now, we're trying to localize, we're trying to, you know, if there's a gun, if there's, you know, crying, sharp teeth, what does that mean? We're trying to give more context. There's a lot of other cultural barriers as well, you know, in, in the desert when it rains, people love the rain, but in England, I don't think that people get depressed when there's rain. So there's a lot of cultural issues as well. And so with each image here, that see, if you see the algorithm, see this yellow part, it highlights the area it's a deep learning network that uses explainable AI. So there's two layers here to it that we feed it to train it. And we add another layer that to help explain why did it make its decision? So it's not just giving us positive or negative. It's telling us why it makes this by highlighting the, the yellow areas, these areas that's highlighted, but the yellow is why it's decision it's made. And these are the questions we ask after each um, uh, image. We ask a set of questions where you, you to help you bonding and collect the emotions related to the image. Was your child feeling sad? Did the, your child, was it a, of himself? Was it done after school or at home? So imagine that if we're gonna now create a prompt that if the file, child's feeling sad and it's at school, we're gonna ask other questions. You know, you know, is a child, you know, are they being bullied? Is someone bothering them? Is there something going on? So that another level of information for the, uh, for the parent. But this is very interesting uh, um, here. This is very fascinating. Um, uh, the work that we're uh, doing, look what happens with the algorithm. We over rely on the algorithm. They're not perfect. It gave me here highly negative, highlights of planes, but here on the right, it gave me it's highly positive, but it looks apparently negative 100%. Right? Why would it give us that? Why would you think that? Because the algorithms are wonky. We trained the algorithms and they had a lot of happy faces, circles. And the algorithm basically, oh, look, oh, these are circles. So these must be positive. Therefore, it's a positive result. But imagine that, imagine like this, you know, somebody that, uh, the opposite, you know, oh, they have cancer and the image tells you they don't have cancer. What would happen in that situation? So we can't over rely on algorithms. They're not perfect, but they will be better over time. And that's why you need professionals and so forth, but you need someone to understand the algorithm and what they're doing. And this is a perfect example of how algorithms, yeah, it looks great on the left, it's perfect, and then the right, oh, it can be something off, right? So we have to be careful, uh, you know, and uh, some of our experiences um, uh, so far, um, 
it's unique. People like it, but it's not for everyone. It's like people are scared about AI and emotions and labeling people and so forth. And and this has been an issue to get more acceptance in the community as well for that. Um, please, I'll give you a second here. We plan to expand this work. My PhD student now is working to expand this work to hopefully and to look at more refugees and and other places where we can we can communicate through art. And that's the beauty. We're not taking pictures of children or anything like that, which is too intrusive or videos, just art. And this is the beauty. You can communicate to art to everyone. Please take a picture of this, download the app, give us your reviews. That's the best thing you can do and help for us. Thank you very much. There's one app I'll talk about. This is another mental health app. Basically, if you heard of the Calm app, we're trying to do something like that in Arabic. I actually had a contract with Qatar Airways. I was creating content. The content was so good that they liked it. They were going to put on the Qatar Airways and then COVID happened. And, uh, but it's really to help you relax, why, you know, stress reduction and uh, guided meditation when you're on the plane, but in the Arabic language. It'll be in Arabic. And this we created this as part of our app. Part of this app that we created this we haven't developed the app it's not out yet i still work with software engineers but the great thing about this it has four areas but we we added culture and religion everyone wants well i want to have you relax and calm i want to hear religious type of invocations religious uh, quran prophetic traditions and we actually gamified uh um a gratitude uh, where you know thank you god for giving me this and you click on a bubble and we're, we're kind of gamifying these cultural important aspects of um, you know mental wellness and well-being within this part of the region we're also developing a responsible AI framework here we got funding for that in the median region and working with Dr. Barry from the College of Law we're trying to develop that as well and you know there's a lot of issues um, uh, with AI ethics and so forth but I know I'm taking maybe a little bit too much time but there's one project that we want to work with cancer patients, and, and but we never got funding for it using AI to build support, a social network for cancer patients in Qatar, but we never got uh, uh, funding for that. So I'll summarize here, challenges we're facing, we're trying to build community support, being resourceful without having much resources, financial stability, commercialization, work with international partners, industrial collaboration, the skeptics of AI, obtaining data, Arabic language, how do we do contextualizing things, culture, religious, and doing evaluations, make sure that what we're doing works and is having an impact. And if it's not, how do we improve it or get rid of it? Um, so take home summary, a bright future for public health and technology, especially AI for public health professionals, especially for surveillance. I know this surveillance is being used in a very bad way, but it can be used in a very good way when it comes to public health. Patients will be more empowered with AI, but we need to educate them when we empower. Physicians will be challenged with new applications that might devalue their expertise but empower their patients, especially with AI. We need more individual studies on public health and artificial intelligence. Remember, again, it's all about the people. Technology is just a tool. And you can connect with me uh, through here. And thank you very much. It's been an honor and wishing you all the best throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you, God bless. All, 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 all the best to you and salam alaikum. Connect with me through LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you. All the best. Thank you everyone for listening to Moafa's amazing talk. I'd now like to hand over to our panel hosts, Femi and Sophie. Hello everyone. Hi everyone. We'll just be adding our speakers, Ray, Naraj and Lina, and we will just be waiting on two other speakers. Yeah, sure. So while we're waiting for the other speakers, I think we'll just give um, a little introduction um, for everyone on the call today. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us back again today for our last segment um, of our conference. My name is Femi and I am the Alumni Relations Officer. My name is Sophie and I am part of the Social Media and Communications team. So this will be an hour-long Q&A session um, where we'll be joined by five fantastic um, speakers, Niraj, Lynette, uh, Lee, Natalie and Ray. Um, so from a variety of backgrounds um, in public health and we'll be explore, exploring the role of technology in public health as well as careers in public health um, and can't wait to hear more about the experience of, of our speakers. 
As mentioned, this next segment will be about an hour long with the first 10 minutes that will be dedicated to introducing our speakers. The following 25 minutes will be a conversation about the role of technology in public health and the last 25 minutes um, we'll be talking about our speakers' careers. Um, so we have some questions planned for our speakers, but don't hesitate to add any other questions in the chat. Awesome. So let me hand over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Um, Ray, did you want to um, start off by saying a few words about yourself? Sure, sure. So uh, I'm Ray Kelly. I'm an exercise physiologist and researcher. Uh, I've been working in health uh, 30 years this year, so a long time, uh, but quite diverse uh, ranges right throughout my career. So I started off in elite sports. So I was preparing athletes for Olympics and World Championship Games. Uh, right from juniors right through to the, the top class. Uh, then I've sort of worked in uh, through general health care like EPs usually do, uh, through to um, formulate, formulating uh, weight loss shakes and working on, uh, I, I formulated Rapid Loss, which was a big selling and, and ran programs online across the country. Uh, worked with uh, elite fighters. So I've trained about 13 world champion fighters, professional boxers, uh, worked on The Biggest Loser. I trained two winners on there from two attempts and uh, worked as a consultant exercise scientist on The Contender and recently did uh, a three-part documentary with uh, Michael Mosley for an SBS documentary on reversal of type 2 diabetes, which is what my PhD is on and that I'm currently doing. So uh, on my fourth degree, so I can understand uh, what students are going through. did my undergrad in exercise science then I uh, went on to a master's in teaching, so secondary PDHPE, uh, did a, a master's in research and now the PhD. But, um, yeah, worked across quite a number of areas. And these days I work within primary care, training doctors and nurses on how to run lifestyle interventions for chronic disease. Oh, fantastic, Ray. We can definitely um, understand your love for academia. Um, and it sounds like your work in type 2 diabetes is really something we're looking forward to. Uh, Naraj, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Niraj, and currently I'm based in Kathmandu. Uh, and uh, I am an MPH alum, so I'm from class of 2015. Uh, it's been quite a, you know, six years um, being, uh, you know, outside of the uni and working in a professional environment, but I actually started working back in 2011. Uh, so we have a bachelor's degree in public health. So after a bachelor's degree, I, I kind of started working in a public health uh, profession. And um, it's been a decade now that I've started uh, to work. And uh, of late, uh, a lot of my work has been concentrated on knowledge management and health communications, uh, which is also a passion. And um, because like health communications has been a passion initially i started working as a radio host uh, so you know just to uh, you know realize that passion and then yeah after 2015 earthquake a lot of my work was focused on you know disaster recovery and rehabilitation efforts and currently i'm working with the british embassy in Kathmandu uh, helping them with their knowledge management and communications especially focusing on evidence based decision making for the top leadership of the embassy here in Nepal, which is one of the prominent uh, development partners uh, to the government. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Awesome, thanks so much, Naraj. And thank you so much for, for joining us, um, you know, from Nepal. Um, you've, you, have, you sound like you have um, a huge breadth of experience all the way from communications to, you know, um, in government bodies. So that's awesome, thank you so much. Um, we'll go to Lee next, hey Lee. Hi everybody, uh, really pleased to be here. I'm Lee. Uh, I work in the Victorian Department of Health as a manager in a team called Strategic Policy and Projects. We're kind of like an internal consultancy and uh, our role is to get deployed to priority projects across the whole department. So on one week I might be working on something related to elective surgery, on another week I might be working on long-term strategy or maybe on COVID response. It really varies um, and so there's a lot of uh, different things that we get to experience and support. Um, my background is in analytics and I've previously led a team of analysts in the department as well. 
And prior to that, I spent around eight years in various types of private consultancy, um, including in social policy, uh, working on things like evaluations, impact assessments, and economic evaluations. Uh, and I actually started my career not even in public health at all, uh, actually in the finance sector. Uh, I completed my MBH at the end of last year. I did it part-time, working full-time alongside, um, and specialized in health economics. Um, yeah, that's me. The only other thing I'd like to add as part of my intro is that I'm coming in to speak to you today as uh, MPH alumni, as opposed to a department representative. Oh, we're so glad to be joined by people who are MPH alumni because it shows us what we can achieve once we'll graduate. Um, and we're also very blessed to be joined by our second staff from Big Health. So we love talking with you guys and we're really grateful to have you here. Lynette, um, last but not least, if Natalie doesn't manage to join us, we'll go straight on to the questions. And if she pops in later, um, we're happy to bring her into the conversation. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Lynette. And um, like a few of the other panelists, I am also one of the alumni um, from the University of Melbourne. So I graduated from the MPH in 2014. Um, I actually just recently returned from a six month post working with the WHO in Geneva, Switzerland, so on COVID-19 response, um, specifically in a very long department name for so the Global Infectious Hazards Preparedness department. Um, my public health career spans or so far spans health promotion and advocacy and digital health in Australia, Mongolia and Switzerland. Um, I'm currently volunteering with Public Health U for a course um, that one of our MPH uh, um, peers is actually leading on disaster management and emergency planning and I guess Public Health U's mission is um, to contribute to the improvements in population health in low to middle income countries um, through building uh, public health capacity via like e-learning at a low or affordable cost so yeah thanks awesome thank you so much Lynette it sounds like you had a whirlwind um, of a career um, um, even though you just graduated not too long ago um, but yeah, thank you so much all for introducing yourselves. We're just going to go ahead and um, get started with some of our questions um, around digital health and technology. So, so the first question I have for you guys is to what extent does data and technology influence your role? So whoever would like to answer first, just put your hand up and I'm sure we can just rebound through whoever can add on to the next person's points. Yeah, Lee. Um, I'm ha happy to kick off. Data is something that's really near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. It's a really key part of the role that I play in the department. Um, part of my role is to develop evidence-based policy to support decision makers. And so without, um, without data, it's really challenging to do that. One of the ways that data feeds into my role is that we make heavy use of administrative data sets that the hospitals uh, report in on a monthly or sometimes less frequent basis. And we use that to understand what are things that are happening in the system, um, what might be some of the blockages or issues, things that are going wrong and where they might be going wrong. And so it really also helps us to gain a better understanding and diagnose so that the solutions that we propose are um, more fit for purpose than logical. So I think it's very important. Yes, I can, I can imagine, especially having data coming in, technology is incredibly important. Does anyone else have? Um, I think Lynette. Oh, Lynette, up. perfect. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I could speak about my volunteer role, um, but I, I'm thinking of an experience just working with WHO recently. So I'm not sure how many, <laughs> I guess um, people on this call or watching this conference today are familiar with social listening, but um, I guess through our work um, with COVID response, it was really important to use social listening methods to understand in real time, you know, what are the conversations that are happening about COVID-19 um, and now with the vaccine as well and the evolution um, and the dynamics of um, high velocity kind of conversations um, that are happening around the world. Um, and this data that was feeding in then enabled us to kind of unpack and understand what are the key narratives, what are the key concerns and um, questions, but also from, I guess, a 
with a public health hat on, what are the opportunities uh, for us to actually act right now? So what's really important in terms of addressing some of these concerns and how do we inform uh, risk communication responses and also, um, I guess, yeah, supporting you know, some of the risk communication um, responses and um, any of these uh, kind of underlying um, evolving needs within the community as well. So the data really, um, or the data in terms of um, the conversations that were happening in online kind of public forums enabled us to um, gain those important insights and then make um, or take action. Sounds quite interesting. Um, just out of curiosity, could you go a little bit more in depth of what social listening is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess working with WHO, there was a tool which you can, um, everyone has public, um, I guess, access to, but we had access to a pub uh, back end as well. Um, it's called EARS for short, so kind of um, very easy to remember in terms of social listening, but it's early AI um, response for social listening. And so the data that was actually collected for um, this social listening tool specifically pulled from online conversations that were, um, I guess, included Twitter um, kind of tweets, um, blogs in English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, um, and we had some pilot countries. So the data was collected and then processed and then classified. So I guess for people that aren't um, too familiar with uh, taxonomies and things like that. We had different categories. So we had 39 categories um, that were devised um, specifically for COVID-19, which were then, I guess, recategorized again to understand, you know, cause of virus or symptoms and things like that. And so we could then um, use a semi-supervised machine learning kind of approach to then unpack you know, maybe all of our, you know, Facebook conversations are all, um, you know, available and we're all talking about our concerns about public health measures or the lockdowns and things like that. So this tool would then categorise that specifically into public health measures and maybe someone has mentioned masks, so um, preventative um Kind of um, categorization would also come up as well and then after i guess looking at all of these and other languages as well um, we could then kind of really look at what are those evolving trends and how do we now intervene and that was really i guess important in terms of um you know a lot of the misinformation that happens, you know, how do we then um, work with partners and um, country officers to, uh, I guess, diffuse or um, correct the misinformation and then, um, yeah, translate or communicate the right information so that people aren't spreading, you know, that we should be drinking the bleach because it's actually going to help, um, you know, us cleanse, like, that's not the right information, but how do we actually hear um, from like these different um, online channels and social listening is just one way for us to actually tap into um, these conversations and make real life-saving, um, I guess, actions as well. Yeah, that is super fascinating. I mean, we definitely need something, a tool like this, particularly um, during this pandemic. And I'm, and I'm thrilled to hear that that exists. So that is um, amazing. Thank you so much for giving insight into that. Um, so yes, Ray. Uh, just I wanted to mention that just on the sort of uh, grassroots level of collecting data through uh, programs in medical centres. So we've been pushing for policy change with the federal government and um, with Diabetes Australia for the last 10 years to acknowledge the reversibility of type 2 diabetes. So we had to, to, to be able to show that this was possible, we had to show, uh, collect the data of, um, of people losing weight and then their reduction in HbA1c. And within the health industry, it's sort of accepted that weight loss is difficult and sustained weight loss is even harder. And, and basically, we've got to teach people how to live with the disease just to, to improve their long-term health. Uh, but that's not what the research has shown over the years. And so we were pushing for that. And thankfully for us, yeah, that, that sort of uh, changed on October 13th this year when Diabetes Australia uh, changed their policy and, and acknowledged, which was great. Um, but this, I guess the reason I point, I point this out is as, as a researcher, you know, you sort of wonder what, what you should be researching. But a lot of the ideas are going to come from people on the ground that are doing the practice. And, and quite honestly, uh, so quite often 
this anecdotal evidence is is dismissed, where it's really the seed for what our research should be, because a lot of our programs, especially in public health, can be sort of contained with red tape, and it's very difficult to really, you know, make make uh, make a, a quality program evolve. Whereas uh, practitioners out in the field who don't get sort of cluttered with that can actually adapt and become more agile. So there's a lot of learnings through that. Uh, but also the collecting the data on a weekly basis also helps us, uh, uh, I, I guess, identify red flags. So we, we know what's predictable with blood sugars and their response to food and exercise and how much weight someone should lose over the course of a 10-week period. So if you see a change in that, um, especially two weeks in a row, you know that there's an issue there and, and you can sort of talk that through uh, with the patient themselves. So you know, I guess what we're hearing across uh, a lot of uh, what we're talking about here is that the, this access to data and collecting data can be very helpful right from the ground up. Wow, I'm just thinking of the impact that reversing type 2 diabetes would have on the burden of disease, and that's definitely something that would just have such a massive impact. Naraj, um, did you have any comments about the role of technology in your role? Um, so especially during the covid pandemic, uh, I was uh, working with the Ministry of Health here. Um, so it was probably at the start of the pandemic. And that's when the ministry actually wanted to get in a lot of international exper experience about how, you know, other countries are doing testing and, uh, you know, something around testing and parking, or even uh, contact tracing stuff. So yeah, it was all about, you know, since it was particularly a uh, very a new disease, so nobody knew what was happening. So a lot of my work was related, trying to synthesize all this information from around the world and trying to bring, you know, the best on the plate for the policymakers in Nepal to decide on the best way to get ahead. Uh, because we, in developing countries context, especially we have uh, limited resources as compared to Australia or any other first world country. Uh, so yeah, that was that was one particularly um, you know, interesting role with the data. And then uh, when I started working uh, with the embassy, uh, I think since March 2020, uh, then I got into something called a COVID monitoring where we were receiving our reports from all the programs that the embassy funds. And we're trying to look into how the programs were pivoting in that context and what sort of collaborations that they were getting with other programs and then trying to make the most out of their uh, presence on the ground because at that time, uh, you know, a lot of programs were not uh, working at, at their maximum. So they had to, you know, uh, pivot to some other things. So in that way, it was kind of helpful to get all these ground level info so that at the top, uh, we could decide how the embassy should go forward in putting its resources and then aligning its resources with the government. So, yeah, it was really key, uh, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. I think... Um... I think through all of these different examples, we can see how important um, data is and how um, how technology and data can definitely influence high level decisions. Um, we do have a question from Zoe. Um, so it is, do you think the pandemic and spotlight on public health has helped cut through the red tape? And Ray, I think this question is particularly addressed to you. Yeah, well, it's difficult to say. I primarily work in Aboriginal health. And one thing that the pandemic did was cut everything except for uh, testing and vaccinating. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot put on hold. And, and we know that, uh, that the impact that poorly controlled blood sugars has on, um, you know, the, the chance of contracting uh, uh, t uh, COVID as well as the, um, you know, the uh, impact it can have. So, you know, I think there's more discussion around that. Um, I think that definitely there's there's been a greater spotlight put on public health in general and the impact that does have on things such as uh, what we've seen through the pandemic. But we're only just coming out of the time now to see whether the red tape has been cut down a bit. Though I guess it's difficult for me to comment on because we had our documentary shown right at the end of what, when, when things opened up in Sydney. So it was around that time. So I guess my view would be very skewed because I had a lot of media around that time. Uh, and then on that same day is when Diabetes Australia released their uh, change in policy. And just last Sunday, the federal government with their diabetes strategy uh, mentioned remission for the first time. So 
I'm hoping so, but it's it's too hard to to gauge so far. But there's definitely a lot of pressure for better outcomes in health. Yes, I think with the government resources that are heavily focused on COVID, it'll take some time to see them redirecting those to um, other diseases. Now we're having the great honour of Natalie joining us. Um, hi, Natalie. We'd love to have you join the conversation. Um, and if you don't mind, we'd love to have a little introduction. Yeah, thank you. And so sorry about being late. I have a little newborn. I was just in the middle of feeding and very hard to coordinate schedules around around her. Um, but just a little bit of introduction about me. Um, I graduated from the MPH in 2014, I think it was, doing a Master of Public Health. Um, and since then, my focus has been on sort of food system sustainability and non-communicable disease prevention. So after I finished, I went overseas and worked uh, for a global startup called the Eat Foundation in Norway for two and a half years in a policy role and then um, moved back to Melbourne about four years ago and set up um, a foundation. I think you've already heard from Sandra DeMeo, so I set up the foundation under his name um, and worked with him for the last sort of two and a bit years. And then since then, I've actually moved to Medibank in a health strategy and digital health role. So happy to sort of discuss that in a bit more depth through the panel discussion. Awesome, great to have you on board and yeah, fantastic work. Um, I love your, um, you know, your ability to, to have, you know, you've had experience both working internationally and as well as locally as well. So I'm sure you'll have some great insights to some of our questions. So we will be moving on to the next question in our technology segment. So, and this is um, Natalie, just to get you up to date, these questions are open to anyone. So if you just want to pop your, ha pop your hand up, um, if you're really keen to answer it. So our next question is, how has technology and working within the virtual environment influenced the way you work and carry out your role? Yeah, right? Well, as a physiologist, you know, we're sort of, face-to-face -face people <laughs> so um but I, I had uh, because i had been expanding my program over a number of years i had the foundations prior to the pandemic uh in place with a, an app and a website and uh video tutorials for patients and healthcare workers and so on but as we saw with every industry we changed and adapt very very quickly so where uh we could identify issues we, we fix those up pretty quickly so um, the thought of a physiologist doing telehealth and things like that seemed ludicrous two years ago, but nowadays it's just part and parcel uh, with with just yeah, uh, ways of care of providing care. That's it, um, exactly. And you know, it's it's great to I guess to see that um, technology has really helped in in this way. Um, yes, Niraj, I see your hand was up. Uh, yeah, uh, like um, Kelly said, like you know, your your uh, profession can actually have a big impact on you know whether you are working virtually or face to face. And uh, since I work in knowledge management and comms, which is also about you know face to face interactions, uh, but uh, what happened especially during the COVID and going virtual was that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have a lot of events to organize. So there's these meetings or some learning events. Uh, so any gathering that's happening and especially pre-COVID, it was kind of hard to get people together, you know, uh, physical meetings kind of, uh, you know, it's hard with attendance and people cannot make on time. But what actually happened with the virtual thing was that people could actually make it because they were working from home and it was a lot easier to get people together and the attendance was ever high. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of one positive uh, coming out of that. And uh, especially during my work with the government, what happened was uh, it's actually, you know, when you work in a government structure, there's a lot of red tapes even around attend your know, organization of meetings. You'll have to send letters, it has to be formal. And so, you know, it's kind of hard to get meetings in a frequency and in a timing that you want. But uh, what really happened is since we are a very new federal we actually entered into a federal structure in 2017. So there are now different layers of government. There's a federal government, provincial government, and the local government. And especially during COVID, all these three governments had to work, to work together in order to produce uh, outcomes. So uh, the virtual working environment was actually very helpful in getting the three governments to collaborate 
uh, well because they didn't have to have physical presence. They could just log on to their you know virtual software and they could talk to each other. So yeah, it was kind of interesting in that sense that it actually got people to collaborate a lot more than what they did pre-COVID. Yes, Natalie, um, I see you have your hand up as well. Um, offices and that itself would be such a huge logistical dilemma. Um, so yeah, um, Natalie, on to you. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, the work that I'm doing currently at Medibank um, is involved in, we essentially ran a research trial um, and a large component of that was the sort of delivery of a digital intervention around physiotherapy-led care um, to prevent people from essentially getting a knee replacement. So people that had osteoarthritis um, and it was to support them in that journey to, you know, not go on to need a knee replacement. And that started and was implemented back in 2019. Um, and that we sort of waited on as a sort of a team at Medibank because we wanted it to be equitable. We couldn't just create a service that was just in Melbourne and Sydney where you would go and see um, a physiotherapist in person. So the whole thing was delivered online. But I think at the time and with the sort of the age group that we were targeting, people were a little bit hesitant of, you know, physio online, this seems a bit weird. Um, but then sort of since COVID has happened, it has just sort of rolled over and now the sort of take up in this program has been astronomical. Um, it's also had fabulous results, which has really helped. But I think it was just that, you know, we started something in digital healthcare quite early where people were a little bit hesitant around what that would be. But then since COVID, it has really accelerated the sort of acceptance and also uptake of the program and some digital programs going forward. Yeah, I think that's the beauty that a lot of people have highlighted about the emergence of digital health during a pandemic. It means that a lot of people have a lot of healthcare that's far more accessible for them, where before people were a little bit sceptical. And this actually, unless Lee and Lynette, do you have anything to add? Yes, Lynette. Oh, apologies. Um, I've got too many um, mouse clicks around my screen. Uh, I just wanted to add on to what Natalie was saying because um, I'm pretty sure uh, my former organisation will have the exact same kind of um, results in terms of the uptake of a um, behaviour change intervention that they're looking to roll out um, across, I guess, GP um, primary health teams. So um, I was previously working at the Royal Australian uh, College of General Practitioners and um, in the Shaping Healthy Australia project. And I guess, yeah, this was prior to my move um, overseas um, to work with the WHO. But one of the things that we found was, um, you know, there was this interesting kind of uh, mixed reaction. Some um, uh, primary health networks were very, very um, encouraged by the opportunity of um, rolling out an app uh, to support uh, some of their patients with um, looking at, you know, how do they meet the Australian guidelines for physical activity and healthy eating, but, you know, with something in their pocket. And then some other um, uh, primary health nurses and um, networks that we were speaking to were like, oh, you know, no, like we'd prefer to have people come in um, to our clinics and have these conversations. And so part of the um, intervention also includes conversation guides so that, you know, through a telehealth consult or even a face to face, um, you know, GPs and primary health nurses actually have these conversation starters, which then can, um, I guess, introduce this uh app and intervention really subtly um, uh, based on, you know, where they're at in terms of, um, you know, what their goals are and things like that. And I think with, um, you know, the rollout of telehealth consults now, like I had an appointment this week and it's just, yeah, it's it's more convenient, you know, to um, just speak to your GP on the phone than have to find a way to get to this clinic, which is now much further than previously, for example, um, to, yeah, be actually considering, well, you know, is this um, where we're kind of moving in terms of um, the future? And I kind of have seen some of the chat conversations. Is this kind of the way um, we'll be interacting? It's something to kind of look out for and look forward to seeing how it pans out. Yeah, completely. Um, 
Thanks. Thank you so much, Lynette. Um, I totally get it. I mean, for me personally as well, I love telehealth conferences um, with the with the GP. You don't have to get out of the house. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Lee, did you have anything to add? I think I saw your hand. Yeah, I just want to um, add that, you know, I agree completely with some of the things that Natalie and Niraj have said about how the changes that have happened over the past couple of years. But I do also want to call out that I think the impacts of COVID have really accelerated the uptake of all of these different um, different ways of working and different devices. So, for example, um, joint replacement and conservative management through telehealth. Um, mm. This is not an area of expertise for me, but I wonder if, um, but given that the technology existed before, I wonder how much of it is an effect of the elective surgeries, for example, being paused. And so as a result, people don't have other options. And so this um, means that what they previously would have discounted becomes a really strong option for them. And so I'm quite curious to see how it pans out over the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, I guess not, although I would like it to be that this is the new way of doing things more effectively and efficiently, uh, I'm really interested to see to what degree people want to snap back um, mm -hmm. when they have actually got the option to go back to their old ways of doing things and their old ways of working. And similar to what Nirasha said about the way people collaborate as well, it's really interesting to see to what degree people want to take on and retain these ways of working, which um, sometimes are much better because they're much quicker, much less friction. You can um, access people and information a lot easier. But um, when things go back to normal and the system isn't under the same level of stress, because it has been mm -hmm. under really extreme stress over the last years, last couple of years, what are people going to decide that they want to do and whether there's necessity for people to make an intentional choice to retain these practices rather than um, just saying, oh, you know, hopefully we keep it, but then sometimes we may lose some of the good things and something to be careful about. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is incredibly quickly moving space. And I think a lot of people are asking questions about, is this how it's going to be in the future? Are we going to snap back to pre-pandemic behaviours? You guys have played perfectly into our hands for the next question, almost to the point that um, it might be a little bit redundant. So we, our next question was actually, has technology helped you collaborate with others within and outside your organisation? And if so, how? And if it's expanded the scope and or impact of your work? And I think you guys have spoken very well to all of those themes. So in the name of time, we have about five minutes left for this section. So the next question is going to be, um, how do you see technology and digital health impacting future careers in public health? Um, we've been in discussion about what the future is going to look like and how do you guys see it? Hey. Yeah, I think that um, just from my perspective with behaviour change and, and chronic disease, I think we're going to see much more advancement in wearable devices and, and, and I guess methods that people can take control. I think one of, one of the great things about things moving online as well is that, uh, that transferring of quality information from informed sources. So we know social media can be pretty bad for poor sources, but it also enables people access to good quality sources as well. And they're, they're, they're sort of getting an idea of where to look for for that information. So from our perspective, you know, like even my kids yeah, are, are wearing wearable devices around health and they, they love it. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got mine just charging here. So mine's got like GPS and everything. And so I can sort of walk out if I'm traveling in a new town. Uh, I travel a bit with work. I can just click a button and set it to say eight or 10 Ks and it will map out from the hotel room so I can do a loop uh, of all the streets without having to worry about getting lost. So, you know, that, that's one of the obstacles, you know, that you might have if you were exercising in a new town or a new area. But, I mean, just for safety, I know that there's technology where we're sort of looking at um, heart rate measures through uh, earphones and it's just the, the scope, I think, is is just going to jump so so great through there and people being able to understand. For, for us, things like glucose monitors, continuous glucose monitors, so people can see the impact of uh, the foods they eat and exercise on their blood sugars. I think that's a great educational tool. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that and the cost of that will come down over time as well. So, yeah, no, look, it, it's exciting in my area. I know that. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Yeah, we can definitely see the the increase in um, uptake of wearable devices, especially for um, people like you who work clinically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's going to be exciting to see where that goes um, and whether that's going to be, you know, equitable. Um, 
Naraj. Um, yeah, but like um, just, you know, since the COVID is a very hot topic to discuss about digital health and future careers in public health. So <clears throat> yeah, my experience has been that, you know, during COVID, uh, since the number was the, the king, you know, like, um, and it suddenly turned public health into a data analytics subject. Uh, like there was a lot of number crunching. People wanted to see great AP curves. You know, they wanted to see data. They wanted to see the table. They wanted to see the heat maps. So everything was about numbers there. And uh, uh, for a time, it took me back because I'm the comms guy. And, you know, uh, th there are a lot of stories coming out. Like the secondary impacts of COVID-19 were much more harsher than the primary impact, especially in a developing country context. So and public health, you remember, it's, it's by definition, it's both a science and an art. So, yeah, the science part of it can be taken care of by the data uh, because, you know, that's where uh, science wants. But, uh, you know, on the on the art aspect of it, uh, public health is a very dynamic thing. It's 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 about dynamic communities. It's about dynamic societies, and it's about a dynamic country as a whole. And uh, and and every number in there is a story in itself, right? But the the what digital health does is it it takes everything to a number, and doesn't tell you a great story about uh, you know people or communities behind those numbers. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm equally excited about all these numbers coming up and we being able to know the, the hard facts that we didn't know before. But I think we should be equally in touch uh, with, um, you know, the stories behind these, uh, these, these contexts because public health is also about context and that's what defines those numbers. I think that's a very interesting comment to make. Um, as MPH students at the University of Melbourne, we have a compulsory subject on the qualitative data analysis that really focuses on the meaning behind numbers and the experiences of people where that data is coming from. So it's definitely becoming quite prominent. Um, Lee, did I see a hand go up before? Yes, you did. Um, and I want to second what Niraj just said about the stories behind the numbers. Now, I'm a numbers person by background. I love numbers. I think data is amazing. Um, but I do think that using numbers well actually does combine the art and science parts of the MBH. And I'd really like to encourage students to also think about not just doing the numbers, but the story behind the numbers in terms of what you can tell from the numbers itself and how to get, um, how to use the real proliferation of data that we're seeing um, over the course of previous years. And also I think that's gonna continue and how to make that into things that are actually useful information so that we can use that to support people's health outcomes, to make decisions, to help, um, for example, to help healthcare providers, patients and community health providers, to help people learn how to do things better. Um, like we've been talking about all this time, there's going to be much more collection of data at every level. Um, but I think there's a real space for understanding how that's translated into action and making sure that we use it, um, you know, use our power of numbers for good rather than for evil. I think it's really important to make sure that we've understood really well what the caveats of all these different things are. Um, and there's a really huge role for data visualization and communications and translation so that people make sure that they don't misinterpret things. And I suppose that goes back to um, what Ray's saying as well, like how do people understand the hierarchy of evidence and what the numbers mean? I just think these aspects and some of these are things that are really focused on in the MPH. Those are the subjects that I personally have found incredibly valuable in my career. And I think they're gonna to continue to be useful in public health. Thanks so much, Lee. And um, that is incredibly, um, you know, inspiring. You know, I think it's really important to acknowledge, um, you know, what what the stories are behind the numbers, and it's great to see that um, you're so passionate about that as well. And um, Rhea will note uh, your your comment in the chat as well. You know, the use of data, especially in Aboriginal health, without understanding um, the people behind those numbers, do add the gap. Um, to, to the gap. So can I just add one obvious example of this that, that I found mind-blowing when I was doing my literature review for my PhD? We always hear about uh, in remote communities, which is where I work, that it can be difficult to engage with community and to uh, to recruit and to maintain um, attendance. And when, when I looked at the data, when I had a look at the research and especially the qualitative um, research as well, uh, what we found was one of the biggest barriers was employment. So all these diabetes programs were run when the AMS was open, the Aboriginal Medical Service was open. So people who had jobs couldn't attend. 
So they might sign up because they were interested and they were trying to, but also when you work in remote communities, you have to travel a bit for work as well, usually. So they, were, they might have been out of town three or four of those 10 weeks where the program was running. Now, this seems very obvious when you lay it out, but it's never, it's hardly ever, virtually never written in the research. And that probably really changes um, the conclusions that are drawn from that research and how they're used um, in the future to make policy changes, make future interventions and campaigns. Now, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the segment about um, the role of technology in public health. We'd really love to move on to the career section and hear more about your careers in general. Um, so the first question I want to open with is what is the first, what is the one thing you wish you knew before entering the public health workforce? And is there like this essential golden nugget of information, um, that you give to someone who's about to do so? Yes, right. I, I did my, and I left school at 16 and I, I did my undergrad I like no one in my family had ever been to uni. Uh, the only uni people I knew were my doctor and my uh, teachers. But I, I went at the age of 29. And by that time, I'd already had a career. So I was already working with the Institute of Sport and developing athletes. And I guess it probably took me the degree, then probably another five years to really, truly understand how to interpret data and how to understand the difference between a good study and a bad. And from that point, like I had access before then, but to truly understand what was good and bad, but then to interpret that data and back myself. And that's why we've got this big push with reversing type 2 diabetes is because in 2006, I felt like quitting. I just thought I'm going to change careers because what I'd learned really doesn't work. And that was because I was just taking it textbook. So trying to implement this like a recipe onto people and it wasn't working because that's how we were taught. And uh, nowadays, I understand there's a lot of nuance there and, and different environments and different populations and strengths and weaknesses. So we know now how to individualize it. But when we talk about research based practice and individualizing a lot in health, but it doesn't happen anywhere near as much as what people talk about. So I think understanding how to truly determine what's good and bad research and where the holes are so the limitations of research because some research is really really good and and useful but you've got to understand the limitations of it and then where you might be able to progress your understanding from there i think the role of individualized medicine in the future is going to be really interesting and individual genotype sequencing on how best um to make intervention interventions work for different people i think is going to be really really fascinating um, anyone else like to share their wisdom? Yeah, Lynette? So this is a <laughs> a bit of a random kind of um, piece of wisdom, hopefully, to share after uh, what Ray has just shared. But um, for me, I think one of the things that's been really helpful was um, my older sister who also did the MPH, um, Lenny, uh, she actually introduced me to the concept of Ikigai, which um, I'll put into the chat a link as well. Um, but the concept of Ikigai, it's a Japanese word and um, it literally means a reason for living. And I I know your question was specifically about entering the public health workforce but for someone like me who specialize in global health even though I have had um, the career that I've had so far there are so many different areas um, that I've really loved so for me um, you know being introduced to Ikigai and having a framework to kind of help clarify um, you know what I'm really passionate about and what kind of mission to work towards um, and profession and the things that I'm good at and the things that I want to avoid, for example, um, that's been really helpful in terms of, um, you know, job applications, understanding, you know, where do I want to go next as well. So um, I know this could be applicable to people outside of um, the public health workforce, but I think from the students that I've mentored um, to date, there's so many that have kind of said, oh, I love so many different areas. And that's exactly like where I was as well. And so having something to kind of guide you to help you really unpack and understand what you love, you know, what you could be paid for, what does the world need, like that really would help you to kind of guide, um, you know, a path or map a path for you as well. So I'll share a link um, in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Um, I remember having a chat to you um, a 
uh, last year, I think. And um, and yeah, Ikigai has really helped me personally as well in that in that journey. So um, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I can see that Natalie and Lee put your hand up at the same time. We'll go with uh, Natalie first. I'll talk really quick. Um, I was just going to say sort of three takeaways. I sort of agree with Lynette around just going with your gut and finding what you're really passionate about and just giving it a go. Um, the second would also be really foster strong relationships with your cohort and your professors because they're going to be, you just will find the same people all the time throughout your career um, and there's always job openings, you know, people are always saying, I've got this role open, like, do you know someone fantastic that would be able to fill it? So I think, yeah, your cohort become, you know, you all become peers shortly and you're all in the workforce and all these wonderful jobs. So the more you network, the better and just foster those strong relationships. Um, and then the third is that, you know, a lot of the time when you're applying for roles, it looks like, you know, there's all these skills that you don't have, but you develop so many skills in the MPH and it sets you up so well for the future workplace. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, everyone in the workforce is just, there's a small part of everyone that's just winging it. Um, so you just got to sort of relax, let go and know that you've been set up really well with the MPH to have amazing skills for, your, for the workplace. I will come in and have a cheeky plug. A great way to foster relationships with your cohort is to join the committee. We've got applications open at the moment and we offer a lot of networking opportunities and we're really fun to join. Um, we have a lot of events that will help you further your professional development um, and have a really good uni experience at the same time. So we've got links for that open on the website, Facebook, Instagram, if anyone watching is thinking about that. Um, and then Lee, on to you. Um, I have some which are sort of similar to the ones that have been said before. I think um, trying lots of things is really great. I think one of the most important things when you're a grad is a great attitude because that will take you so many places. If you're highly motivated and you have a really good attitude, you will um, find so many different opportunities. Um, my next one is slightly more boring. It may not be what you want to hear, but uh, please work on your core skills because those are things that make it easy to employ you as a public health grad. Um, they're not exciting. They're things like be able to write well in a succinct way. Maybe that's slightly different from academic writing. It might be more like simple English, but make sure that, you know, depending on the area of work that you want to go into, that you can do some of those things. If it's comms, make sure that you understand how to do um, some of those um, different styles of writing. It doesn't mean that you have to know before you start, but at least be aware of things like what is my audience thinking and what might they want to hear from me and how to put myself into the shoes of others. So even if you haven't done it before that you understand conceptually that some of these things are important. Um, another one that's uh, a really big thing for me is making sure that people have basic quantitative skills. Um, please try to learn Microsoft Excel as part of your degree or at some point. Um, I know it might not be so exciting for some of you, but in the workforce, some of these core skills are what really sets you apart from other grads because it means that you can do stuff um, that other people might not be able to do when they first start. And the last one is if you have the opportunity, you go and try different workplaces. And quick plug for doing PPU and my team at the department, we're really fun. Um, but those types of activities, if you have the opportunity to do them, getting work experience, it really helps you to make those connections like what Natalie had been mentioning earlier, but it also helps you understand what to expect in the workforce. So then when you're writing applications, it means that you can tailor it a bit better and come up with your key skills um, that you've already identified, for example, through Ikigai or some other way that works best for you. Yeah, thank you so much for those practical tips, Lee. I'm sure that's going to be super useful for a lot of our students listening on the call today. Um, and yeah, and I think it also comes back to a level of self-awareness as well um, in terms of, you know, what you know are your core skills and what you do need to improve on. So I think that's a really important point that you make. Um, I will move on to our next question, which is, is your current career vision and pathway different from the one that you had when you were a public health student? Yes, Naraj. Yeah, for me, um, uh, when I started out, um, I wanted to do something around um, data analysis and, um, you know, that's what I worked on. Uh, but as I graduated through my profession, you know, I was more and more interested in communications. So, yeah, uh, like right after two and a half years 
post my undergrad um, in public health, I started working as a radio host. So that was that's quite a fun. And then, yeah, and then since then on, like comms and health promotion work, um, and you know now on the knowledge management and 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 communications has continued from there on. Um, and uh, what I've realized is that, <clears throat> like uh, especially during COVID, uh, that in 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 public health, like you know, we talk about how how different health indicators have been impacted. Uh, but you know, now my job has been to you know read the secondary impacts of COVID nineteen, how different sectors have been affected, and how it does affect the health indicators at large. So currently, since I have an opportunity to work in non health projects as well can collaborate with them and there's so much i can learn like when you just get stuck to public health you kind of limit yourselves to the the approaches the models the frameworks that have been applied in various other sectors so yeah uh, whenever in your career you have an opportunity to you know even work or contribute to any non health projects i you know thoroughly recommend you to do so because it's been an eye opener and now i've got tons of knowledge from agriculture from education from road construction projects to bring into the public health and apply it you know whenever i'm working uh, back into like a full time uh, public health project I think that's one of the beauties of public health. And whenever I have anyone who asks me, it's like, what are the jobs in public health? I just go anything, anything you want. I think it's so great to be able to do so many things because you have such transferable skills. Ray, I saw your hand up for a moment. Yeah, I, I, I smiled straight away because I only did uni because I wanted to go further in uh, elite sport. So I was uh, already preparing athletes for the Olympics and things like that when I came in. And I was just doing the degree, so I had better opportunities. And I realized after the 2000 Olympics, um, yeah, it shows my age, um, I, um, that the funding was going to dry up a fair bit. So initially I was getting into it for the flash track suits of traveling the world with the Australian team and the representative teams. And that was all great. Uh, but, you know, even at the top end of that, you don't earn a great deal of money in comparison to other industries, really. So, you know, that, that was always a young man's job. But after the 2000 Olympics, I started sort of getting into sort of more you know, uh, lifestyle diseases and things like just weight loss programs and things like that. And, but what I found was what I'd learned through working in elite sport and through my degree was perfect because uh, one thing that people that haven't studied exercise physiology and things like that wouldn't know is it, it's very big on planning. So well, certainly my degree was. So what I found was I could plan... Well, I was used to planning two, three, four-year programs for development of athletes. So to do a 10-week program, a 12-month long-term weight loss program, whatever, was easy. I just I could do it on a napkin uh, and, and pull it all out in my head. So I think that that was part of the success of a part of the reasons for my success. But also with the teaching side of things, you know, you improve your communication. So it was, you know, to be able to go then into mainstream health. It was a simple transition for me, and I could never have imagined I'd be even interested in working in diabetes, never mind having the passion I have these days. So it's one of those things that, you know, you'll be doing your degree, but you don't even know yet what you don't like about the job you, you want to get. So that, that's what's going to determine whether you want to stay there or not. And um, there's so many different variables in there, but just keep your mind open. Just because you're doing a job now or when you graduate, you don't have to do that for life anymore. That's sort of your grandparents' era. <laughs> so, you know, you can just sort of uh, adjust and learn and reskill or just, and the best advice I'd give on that is volunteer, spend time with people who are experts in the field where you can, and you'll learn a lot and they'll expect very little from you. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Um, I think that's really insightful. And yeah, it's it's a little bit relieving to know that you don't have to be perfect as soon as you graduate and you can learn along the way. So um, so yeah, that's, that's very reassuring. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, do we have anyone else who wanted to contribute? Uh, I think Lee, sorry. Um, just seconding Ray's comments. So you don't have to know, um, you don't even have to have an idea of what your pathway is going to be when you're a public health student. Um, talking about my journey as a student, I took six years to graduate from the MBH. I know it's only a two-year full-time course, but it took me a really long time because I worked multiple different jobs through the process. And part of that was because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished. And that's okay, at least 
I think it's okay. Um, hopefully, you'll will find it okay too. But uh, part of that was part of why that was good for me was because it meant that as I found things that were interesting at work, I could adapt my degree. And so I might encounter, for example, health economics at work, and then I'd be like, all right, I'm going to do the health economics course um, in the next semester, and then build on that and see where that takes me. And so I suppose what I'm trying to say at the end of this is that it's great if you have a career vision. Um, and by all means, definitely work towards that. But it's also okay if you don't. And it's also okay if whatever you're doing now is completely different. Because, for example, for me, I didn't really have um, a clear career vision at all when I started. And by the end of my career, I had done all of my number subjects. So it's just go with the flow a bit sometimes. Your words are all very soothing for any MPH student quarter life crises. Um, I'm going to smush the last couple of questions together. Um, just a little bit about what you, all of you enjoy and or find challenging about your current jobs. I think that's always a great insight. I think, Ray, you said you don't even know what you dislike in a job until you do it. So like, yeah, what do you enjoy and or find challenging in your current position? Yeah, uh, what I enjoy is the smile on pe people's faces when they come off insulin, <laughs> when they when they have a HbA1c that's normalized, where they don't have, uh, they, they put their diabetes into remission. Uh, I could be paid in that if I could if I could go shopping with it, <laughs> if I could buy some food. But yeah, you know, it's amazing. I just love my job. I've like I said, thirty years, and I still just jump out of bed and love traveling around to the communities and and working in with that. Uh, challenging um, is actually relates to healthcare professionals. So probably a lot of people would think working in Aboriginal health that the social issues and remoteness are my biggest obstacles, and they're not even close. My biggest obstacles are healthcare workers that. Uh, maybe stuck in old ways, uh, not up to date with the research, um, gatekeepers of information. Um, it's unfortunate. And obviously with Aboriginal people, racism as well. So, you know, we, um, you know, like it's challenging and it's frustrating because it's 2021 and, and, you know, we expect more. But I understand that change comes hard for some people, not the patients. And I guess that's probably the other frustrating thing is we always hear patients getting the blame for poorer outcomes but i think as health professionals we need to wear that that we're, we're the ones that are, uh, are trained in this so if we're not getting attendance if we're not getting the outcomes what can we do better uh, and if we set that bar for ourselves we will get better outcomes and we see that with you know we run programs in burke brewara and awoga even in mount druid in sydney which is you know a very challenging location you know and um we we get great weight loss people coming off medications every single time every location Whereas when we turn up, we're always told, oh, it's hard to engage patients and people don't turn up and, you know, they won't take their medication, all these sorts of excuses, I guess. So um, that aside, the smiles, fantastic. That is amazing to know. And, you know, there's a saying that goes, you know, you go into the system not to become the system, but to change the system. So that is exactly what you're doing. So thank you so much, Ray. Um, did we have anyone else who wanted to speak to that? Lee? This is going to sound hugely nerdy after Ray's um, beautiful <laughs> comments about seeing people's smiles. And I love that so much, Ray. That's so great. Um, this, one of the things that I enjoy most about my current job, which you know, hugely nerdy, is the thrill of learning something new and being able to communicate that so that you can get a decision made. Um, one of the things that I do in my job is I often work with really large data sets, like millions of little, you know, administrative episodes that you see when people are going to hospital. And the idea that you can actually learn something new from all of that, and it sort of comes together and becomes, you know, becomes something that you've learned that you can use to make change. I think that's, um, that's just really incredible to me. And um, the other thing I really enjoy in my job is uh, helping other people learn and uh, pursue their own interest, especially when those interests align with mine around evidence use and modeling. I do think one of the most challenging things um, about my job, and I suspect about other people's jobs in public health as well, is that it can get quite intense. And I think that one of the things that maybe as public health professionals, what we do is because we believe a lot in what we're doing, we give a lot as well. And 
that's never been more true than, for example, for some of us who have been through this last two years trying to support things like COVID response, um, whether you're directly working on the front lines um, or you're in a back office in admin trying to support things or you're trying to support people from the impacts of deferred care that they can't reach their um, healthcare provider and you're trying to help them manage through. Um, I think it's just been incredibly challenging and draining for all of us as public health professionals as well to try and support that. And so one of the challenging things is to try and ensure that we can find ways to make our work sustainable so that we can continue um, doing things that we're passionate about. Completely. Um, thank you so much, Lee. And yes, I can definitely attest to that. Um, you know, being part of your team just earlier this year was amazing. And I could see um, you sort of be such a great mentor to me and so many others. Um, Natalie and Naraj, I'll come back to you. Um, in terms of what I found exciting about my role, um, we are sort of collaborating with research institutions um, around diabetes prevention or osteoarthritis prevention. And then we are doing research trials and then essentially being able to implement them straight away. So rather than having that sort of 17 year lag between research and intervention and actually being able to implement something we're doing sort of rcts or you know observational studies or sort of best evidence we can and if it's successful we're just going and implementing it straight away and i think seeing that really fast paced um, research to sort of practice is really exciting and you know then we get to work with best in class um, universities and researchers around these topics um, in terms of What's challenging? Um, I would say it's maybe around um, steering the conversation to prevention rather than just um, sort of focusing on sort of end scale. You know, obviously we're at private health insurance, so we're looking at how we can, you know, it's, it's a private health insurance company. They're just looking at that sort of acute sort of end stage. Um, so sort of pivoting that conversation is happening and that's what's actually also exciting but it's also a little bit of a challenge of sort of moving that dial um, earlier in the prevention space. Yeah, completely. And I think, you know, that comes back to power dynamics as well and, you know, what traditional power looks like. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely difficult to steer that conversation towards prevention and public health. Um, so thank you, Natalie. Um, I will go back to Naraj. Yeah, uh, I, you know, associate with a lot of uh, what Lee has said. Um, so I deal with a lot of qualitative data. I get a chance to read uh, reports from across the British Embassy's portfolio and then <clears throat> try and synthesize them and bring it into like three or four key strategic messages. And then when it gets on board into a, into a meeting and then gets decided, that's when, you know, you have that aha moment that, you know, something has been done um, on the work you put on. And then uh, the other exciting uh, thing that I feel is that since um, now, like I said, I also deal with non-health projects, uh, you know, uh, so you, you get to know a lot of interesting stuff that are happening in other areas that could be easily replicated into public health. Um, and, and that's very exciting. And I get to recommend a lot of health projects about, you know, how you should collaborate with some other non-health projects. And uh, yeah, and uh, one of the things that, you know, Professor Rob Moody, I, I guess everybody knows Rob Moody. Uh, so one of the things that he always said was that the magic happens outside your comfort zone. So, you know, that that's what I found out is that whenever I've looked into areas which I didn't find interesting or which I was comfortable with, I've always found solutions to very key public health problems. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's exciting in that sense. And the challenging part is, uh, you know, when we are grad or undergrad, we get exposed to log frames and how you design projects and uh, within the stipulated time deadlines. And uh, the the uh, the dynamic thing about public health is a lot of those projects don't get completed or don't meet the outcomes in the stipulated time. Uh, it takes time. Um, societies take time to change. Institutions take time to change. And it's it's equally a challenging thing, uh, but you know, a great learning. Um, about how to go about delivering them uh, at the right time the next time you approach it. Yeah, definitely. I think we've had that reoccurring theme in this conversation that change does take time, but it will happen um, and it will result in better health outcomes for everyone. Now, Lynette, we would love to finish on you um, and hear what you have to say about your job. 
Oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I echo what everyone's just mentioned, but I just wanted to kind of go back to what I um, shared in my introductions. I'm currently volunteering um, with Public Health U and um, moderating this really fantastic online discussion um, with students all across the world, um, specifically on disaster management cycles and response and recovery. And so um, currently in the discussion, people are sharing what their key challenges or what they've identified are key challenges and um, issues experienced by the aid agencies um, in the aftermath of the Asian tsunami of uh, 2004. And we're also reflecting on um, strong and weak decisions, um, I guess, you know, personal reflections on strong and weak decisions that were made during the COVID-19 recovery efforts. And I guess if we bring it back to the theme of um, technology, um, you know, with what is actually on offer, um, you know, this health science course being made available online then enables us um, to, uh, I guess, provide this education. And as Lee was mentioning before, like I love learning and I also love teaching and being part of that journey. So it's been a really great honor to hear and learn the experiences of some of these students um, through the discussion. So I've been hearing about um, the, I think it's the Nigerian and the Nepalese experience of um, COVID-19 and how public health measures were rolled out. And um, I guess what is also happening is the understanding of you know what was best practice there and how do we potentially take those lessons learned and apply it for um, context going forward as well. And I think back to Naraja's point as well in terms of a challenge for the students that kind of shared that, well, the institu uh, institutions would take time to make those changes, even if we can identify as a cohort um, what has worked and what hasn't worked or what's really puzzled us. So, um, yeah, thanks for um, allowing me to share a reflection here. Thank you so much, Lynette. And, um, you know, I really appreciate um, your your response also linking back to our first, you know, topic on, on digital health. It's, it's been so insightful and thank you everyone else. Um, just noting the time as well, um, I'd love to round off by saying, you know, thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate um, your, your time and sharing your experiences. I think so many of our students on, on the call will definitely have learnt so much from this. So thank you all. Yes, and you you all have a very lovely dynamic in a Q&A panel discussion. We're all very fortunate <laughs> that you rebounded off each other as well as you did. So I think we've got the perfect panelists. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to um, hand over to our head of the event, Zainab, to have some concluding remarks. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Femi and Sophie, and thank you to all of our panellists. This was so great and super informative. I literally cannot understate how much we've learnt just from listening to everyone. Um, and, yeah, so feel free to jump off. This is just the conclusion, um, and we really, again, really, really appreciate your time. So thank you, Ray, Natalie, Lee, Naraj, and Lynette so much. See you there. Bye. Awesome, perfect. Um, and now um, I'm just gonna hand over to our president um, for some final words, thank you. Thanks, Zainab, and thank you everyone for being online for so long. It's been a long day, we can't wait to stretch our legs. We really do hope that you've enjoyed the first ever Melbourne Population Global Health Student Society Conference, and I'm very confident that going forward, this will become an annual thing. Now. It is very sad to say that many of us are leaving the committee at the end of this year, but I think it's very fitting with the theme that we've had. It's a new, era of, a new era of public health and a new era of committee members that will be joining us. So I'd like to thank our wonderful committee that we have. And I'd also like to hand over the virtual baton to your new president, Sophie. So Sophie will be looking after the committee. And um, if you'd just like to say a few final words and thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much, Maz. It's been, my chair is stuck. <laughs> That's a good start. It's been really lovely, you know, watching the first um, conference come together and seeing the committee work so hard behind the scenes um, and with all our amazing speakers who have really made such an effort. Um, it's really inspirational and it just shows that 
we're capable of so much, especially with Zaina putting in so much effort behind the scenes um, and really making this a really great experience. And I hope you have enjoyed it just as much as we have. All right, well, that is us done for the day. Um, we hope to see you uh, at our networking event at Prince Alfred on Grattan Street at 7 p.m. tonight. Um, we would love to meet you all in person um, and continue the conversation from today. So, hope to see you guys there. All right, bye.